House to be again in committee on the Counter-Terrorism and Border Security Bill. Baroness Williams of Trafford. My Lord, I beg, my Lords, I beg to move that the House do now again resolve itself into a committee upon the bill. The question is that the House do again resolve itself into a committee upon the bill. As many as are that opinion will say content. Yes. Contrary not content, the contents have it. In Clause 21, Amendment 60, Baroness Williams. My Lords, the Government amendments in this group make a number of necessary changes to the provisions in Schedule 3, governing the retention of property and the power to make and retain copies of documents and other items. The new powers under Schedule 3 have been introduced to strengthen the tools of our law enforcement officers to tackle the harmful activities of hostile actors. Over recent years, we have seen a number of foreign powers demonstrating a significantly increased risk appetite regarding the conduct of their intelligent officers and agents. They seek to acquire and pass on property or information that would damage our national security. This could include highly classified, protectively marked UK government material, prototypes of UK defence infrastructure and hardware, or even the contact details of persons employed by our secret intelligence agencies. The committee will appreciate that to assert themselves in this way, foreign intelligence officers or those acting on their behalf are known to actively use the cover of certain professions. This includes journalists, lawyers and others. There is therefore a national security imperative for the police to be able to retain copy and examine articles which may also include confidential journalistic or legally privileged material. In response, Schedule 3 introduces new powers that would allow an examining officer to retain, examine, copy and potentially destroy a person's property, including confidential material, where the officer believes it could be used in connection with a hostile act or to prevent death or serious injury. One, once a person's property has been retained under these powers, no further action can be taken without the authorisation of the Investigatory Powers Commissioner. The retention process <coughs> excuse me, requires the Commissioner to consider representations made by the owner of the article, the police and the Home Secretary before coming to a decision. Section 3 of the Draft Schedule 3 Code of Practice, which I recently circulated to Noble Lords, outlines the steps and timings for this process, which have been designed to strike a balance between affording the examinee an opportunity to defend possession of their property with the op operational need to retain, use or potentially destroy it. The entire process from the point at which the property has been retained to the point at which the Commissioner authorises further action may take as long as four weeks, but could possibly take longer as a result of delays or appeals. In the vast majority of cases, this process will be the right one, as there will not be an urgent need to examine the property and the immediate risk will have been mitigated by dispossessing the individual of the article in question. In some cases, however, these timeframes will not be acceptable, in particular where, the, uh, where, the, where urgent action is needed to prevent death or significant injury or a hostile act. An example of such a situation might be where hostile agents are trying to leave the UK with information de detailing live UK intelligence agency operations, capabilities and employees. Stopping an agent with this material and being able to access it immediately will give the police a greater chance of determining whether other hostile operatives are in, possess in possession of the material and which UK intelligence officers or agents are potentially at risk of exposure. In such a case, an expedited process would allow an urgent decision to be taken on whether the property should be returned to the individual in parallel to examining the property to mitigate the immediate threat. Amendment 77 would provide for this expedited process by allowing the examining officer, with the approval of a senior officer not below the right rank of superintendent, to examine or copy the property, including confidential material, before a decision has been made by the Commissioner. This mechanism would require authorisation to be given or withheld by the Commissioner or a delegated Judicial Commissioner after the event. Should the Commissioner withhold that authorisation, 
he would have the power to direct that the article be returned to the examinee and the destruction of any information taken from it, including copies. As with the existing process provided for in the Bill, the decision of the Commissioner will be taken after consideration of any representations made by affected parties, and there will also be an opportunity to appeal that decision where it has been delegated to a Judicial Commissioner. The, this urgency procedure has been modelled on similar provisions in the Investigatory Powers Act in relation to interception warrants and has been set out in further detail in Section 3 of the Draft Code of Practice. We have considered with Operation Partners and the um, IPC whether an expedited prior author authorisation procedure could be put in place, but have concluded that while the process could be truncated, the requirement to receive and consider representations is such that any fast-track prior authorisation procedure, procedure would still take some di days. I want to reiterate that these powers would only be used in the most urgent circumstances and subject to the safeguards that I've described. The consequences of misusing the power are clear. The Commissioner may direct the destruction of any information acquired through use of the property. My Lords, if I can now turn to Amendments 78 to 82, which concerns similar retention powers for copies that consist of or include confidential material. These amendments aim to make two key changes. First, as with Amendment 77, which I've just described, they would provide for an urgent process for the retention and use of copies that consist of or include confidential material. Secondly, they will ensure that the non-urgent process for retention of copies works in the same way as the non-urgent retention process for a person's property. I note that Amendment uh, 81, in the name of my noble friend Earl Attlee, also seeks to provide for this. Currently, my Lords, the Bill does not afford affected parties the opportunity to make representations before the Commissioner decides to approve or otherwise the retention and use of copies. In applying the urgency procedure to copies, including the provision enabling affected parties to make representations, the amendments also provide for representations to be made in non-urgent cases. In summary, my Lords, the aim of these amendments is to ensure that there are symmetrical process for the retention of property and the retention of copies of that property that consist of or include confidential material. I hope that my noble friend is reassured that the Government amendments will give effect to what he was aiming to achieve. My Lords, the remaining amendments in this group are comparatively minor or consequential. Amendment 70 is a con consequential amendment to clarify that the process of retention will be different where the urgency condition applies. Amendments 72 and 73 are to clarify that the Commissioner may specify the time phrase, frames for receiving representation through the non-urgent process which are currently outlined in the draft Schedule 3 Code of Practice. Amendments 74 and 75 refine the definition of an affected party in paragraph 13.3 of Schedule 3. Currently, the Bill specifies that representation to the Commission by the Police in relation to a person's property that has been retained under the new retention powers should be made by the Chief Office, Officer of the Police Force to which the examining officer belongs. The amendments allow for the possibility of a Chief Officer from a different force to make those representations, and this is because the force to which the examining officer belongs will not always be the investigating force, and so would not necessarily be best placed to make representations regarding the decision to retain the property. Amendment 76 clarifies that the requirement to invite representations from a person whose property has been retained applies only so far as it is reasonably practical to do so. This is to allow for a situation where it is not possible to get in, in contact with the person, for example, because they provided false contact details. Finally, Amendment 60 is a drafting amendment to ensure that Clause 21 appropriately describes the provisions in Schedule 3. I hope, my Lords, that my explanation uh, for these amendments is clear uh, and the Noble Lords agree with the importance of being able to act quickly against the imminent threat of hostile activity. And I beg to move. Amendment proposed, page 22, line 4, leave out from borders to the end of line 7. My Lords, um, I have some 
small questions, if I may, for the Minister, and I hope she's been given uh, notice of, of these in, in her brief. I, I contacted the Bill team yesterday. I think she's largely answered one of them, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, in amendment, uh, her amendment 73 and elsewhere, there's provision for a cut-off to the period for representations, and I, I understand the need for that. Um, is there a timetable for the rest of the process? The affected party, the passenger, um, uh, it, it's likely to be significant to him. Um, secondly, in Amendment 76 and other amendments, and she's just mentioned this, an example of what's not reasonably practicable. She, she mentioned the possible difficulty of getting in touch with the individual, and again, I, I understand that. But does the term reasonably practicable go to that sort of thing, in other words, on the part of the um, person trying to get in touch, or is it looked at at all from the point of view of the passenger? Because um, destruction of an article or conditions as to the use of the article are likely to be significant in this situation. And thirdly, the urgency condition um, in um, Amendment 77, a similar question, um, who assesses what is urgent? Is it the Home Office, the Commissioner? Is it urgency in the eyes of the passenger? Um, if she can help just flesh out some of that, these queries, I, I'd be grateful. Well, could I just uh, add one further question to the, the ones that have been raised by the noble Lady Baroness Hamwe, and it does relate to the um, urgency procedure, and um, the noble Lady Baroness Hamwe has already asked who makes the decision as to um, uh, what is or is not urgent. Um, but could we also have some feel, based on uh, presumably the um, experience of the agencies concerned, as to how frequently they expect to be using this procedure? Um, my Lords, in terms of um, the kind of situation that we can expect the urgency provisions to be used in, um, and that possibly goes to the Noble Lord, Lord Ross's question about how frequently, I, I mean, I personally find it difficult to know how frequently on average in a week, year, or any given time scale, but clearly some of these um, events have got um, a spike uh, nature to them. So I hope you'll accept um, th that I can't actually answer the question uh, definitively. Um, but to, basically to disrupt uh, a live threat, so where a hostile agent is trying to leave the UK with information detailing live UK intelligence agency operations capabilities and employees. So stopping an agent with this material and being able to access it immediately will give the police a greater chance of determining whether other hostile operatives are in possession of the material and which UK intelligence officers or agents are potentially at risk of exposure. And obviously, thinking back to the Salisbury event, in the aftermath of something like Salisbury, Schedule 3 powers would provide the police with additional tools to stop and question persons with potential links to the hostile state or the actors uh, who may have knowledge or involvement in the attack. And in such a scenario, my lords, it would be critical to analyse their devices and material obviously at speed uh, in order to understand to what extent they've been engaged in hostile activity. Um, the noble lady um, talked about the time frame. Um, obviously the, the urgency procedures will only be used where there's an immediate risk of death <coughs> or significant injury um, or a hostile act being carried out. In such a case the police must be able to act with immediate effect. But um, in terms of um, uh, the, um, whether, whether we could have done it the other, other way round and a prior authorisation procedure being put in place, um, it, it would still take some days. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Um, the point about um, 
the urgency process uh, making it very, very difficult for, to uh, make representations to the Commissioner, i.e. 24 hours. Is that enough? Should the time process be longer? Um, the timescales for the urgency process really aim to strike that balance between giving the property owner enough time to make representation and ensuring that the police are not able to use the property without judicial authorisation um, uh, and, 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 and therefore provide that the decision must be taken uh, by the Commissioner within a three day period. But we also conceive it as being uh, by the same token likely that the property owner will want a decision as quickly as possible to prevent the police from using their property without a decision by the Commissioner. Um, so the draft Schedule 3 Code of Practice, which is available online, is clear that the examining officer must provide a notice that will explain to the property owner that they are invited to make representations to the Commissioner, including contact details and the associated timescales. Um, did the noble uh, lady ask me about what happens if the property owner cannot be contacted? reasonably practicable she did um, yes she did and I've got the answer here as if by magic um, my lords paragraph 63 of the draft schedule 3 code of practice is clear that where the examining officer retains a person's property beyond the period of examination the officer should ask the person how they would prefer to be contacted regarding the status uh, or return of their property the officer will typically seek to acquire a phone number, email, postal address, etc., of the examinee. But in terms of the um, urgency process, the, examiner, the examining officer would attempt to use the details provided by the examinee to make uh, contact and to provide the information. Um, and this would typically include uh, attempting to call the person a number of times, as well as sending them uh, information by recorded post and email. If the person is at the known UK address, then the officer from the local force could then be tasked to attend the address to deliver the re relevant information in person. But obviously, it wouldn't be reasonably practical for the po person to, the, for the police to take this approach on every occasion or where where the person is abroad. And it wouldn't be re reasonably practical for the examining officer to make contact with the person where they've actually provided false contact details. Hope that uh, satisfied the noble lady. Oh, so before the noble lady and the minister sits down, uh, I, I do appreciate that uh, uh, the government can't uh, stand at the dispatch box and announce it's going to be used X number of times a month, a week or a year. Of course, I understand that. But is the provision in there because of previous experience that there is uh, a gap in the arrangements which, for which we have had to pay a price because we haven't been able to enact the procedure, or is it in there because there is a feeling that there might arise a need for such a procedure in the future? Well, I think um, I mean, there's, there's several answers to that. Obviously, the Terrorism Act of 2000 uh, needs, needs updating. Um, clearly, the Salisbury attack showed us um, the need to update our, our laws in this regard. Uh, and clearly, the way that uh, technology and other things have moved on provides for a gap um, in, in our abilities because they haven't been provided for in previous legislation. Question is that Amendment 60 be agreed to. As many as are that opinion will say content. The contrary not content. The contents have it. The question is that Clause 21, as amended, stand part of the bill. I rise to move that Clause 21 and Schedule 3 of this bill do not stand part. I'll later move specific amendments, but it's my view that Schedule 3 should be entirely removed from this bill. Schedule 3 creates a new reg regime where anyone who is travelling into or out of the country can be searched, detained, interrogated and forced to hand over any confidential documents without any suspicion by the border guards. That means that anyone could have their travel interfered with for no good reason. But of course, it could easily be people of black, Asian or minority ethnic groups who will be disproportionately targeted by these broad powers. 
These powers actually already exist for the purposes of establishing whether someone is or has been involved in acts of terrorism. They are contained in Schedule 7 of the Terrorism Act 2000. But the government now seeks to extend those powers beyond terrorism to a very broadly defined set of hostile acts which include threatening national security or threatening the so-called economic well-being of the United Kingdom. And border officers can force anyone to hand over documents and information and it would be a criminal offence to say no. Border guards can detain anyone at the border for up to six hours without needing anything at all to suggest that the person has done anything wrong. And a person who is questioned or detained has no right to remain silent and commits a criminal offence if they do so. An individual who is detained under these powers will have a right to speak to a solicitor, but the bill doesn't appear to require them to be informed of this right until they've been detained for at least two hours. And then, if a detainee chooses to speak to a lawyer, to a solicitor, this can be delayed by <coughs> officers under paragraph 25 or simply ignored altogether under paragraph 24. Additionally, paragraph 26 allows the police to watch and listen to the private conversations with the solicitor. I cannot believe that this is anything other than a fundamental attack on legal privilege and confidentiality. These powers are simply too broad, too intrusive, and means that anyone passing through a port or airport is essentially waiving their basic legal rights. Now, while some people might consider this a proportionate when it applies to finding terrorists, it's completely unjustifiable when applied to find out whether people are threatening the economic well-being of the United Kingdom. And so I should like the Minister to clarify some points for me. What does threatening the economic well-being of the United Kingdom mean? Has the phrase been defined anywhere and has it been considered by the courts? Would a business person who moves their business from the UK to another country be threatening the economic well-being of the UK? And why does the bill allow people to be detain detained for up to six hours without a single suspicion that the person has done anything wrong? Would any membership of your member of your Lordship's house be prepared to be detained at the border for six hours without any suspicion that they'd done anything wrong? I think if it were applied to us, as it could well be, then we would think it most unfair. And how will the government ensure that these suspicionless powers aren't used in racist and discriminatory ways, further entrenching the abuse that black and Asian men face with existing stop and search powers? My Lord, there are dozens of amendments that could be made to Schedule 3 of this bill, but I think it's so fundamentally wrong that it must be opposed altogether. I beg to move. Uh, rise to support the noble Baroness Jones of uh, Morscombe in opposing the additional powers conferred by Schedule 3 to this bill, and for some of the reasons that the noble Baroness has just mentioned. We've already debated whether Schedule 7 of the Terrorism Act powers are used appropriately in every case, and increasing concern from complaints made to me that Schedule 7 powers may be being used arbitrarily, particularly against black and other ethnic minority passengers, resulting in missed flights with no compensation. As the briefing provided by Liber Liberty suggests, Schedule 3 covers a potentially vast and uncertain range of behaviours, that is, and I quote Schedule 3 para 1 1, a person who is or has been engaged in hostile activity. The bill defines hostile activity as any act, as the noble baroness has just said, any act which threatens national security, the economic well-being of the UK, or which constitutes a serious crime, where the act is carried out for and on behalf of a state other than the United Kingdom, or, or otherwise in the interests of a state other than the United Kingdom. Yet the person need not be aware that they are engaged in a hostile activity, and the state for which the hostile act is being carried out need not even be aware that the hostile act is being carried out. As currently worded, someone from Paris or Frankfurt travelling to the UK to encourage UK businesses to relocate to their cities in the face of Brexit will be caught by these provisions. 
in that his mission would threaten the economic well-being of the UK and would be the interests of another state, France or Germany. In a later group, the noble Lord Lord Anderson of Ipswich uh, has an amendment in relation to the definition of what a hostile act uh, should be. Uh, and it may be that, uh, that we, will re we will obviously return to this subject then. My Lords, this schedule and its powers, uh, con uh, it contains, according to the Home Office briefing that we were provided with, are supposed to be a response to the attempted assassination of Sergei and Yulia Skirpal. And yet almost all commentators agree that this was an act of terrorism already adequately covered by Schedule 7 of the Terrorism Act. Perhaps the Minister can give an example of, host of a hostile act that has been committed against the UK that was not an act of terrorism. The fact sheet provided by the Home Office suggests these provisions are needed because, and I quote, the UK, the UK faces a sustained threat from hostile actors seeking to undermine our national security in a wide variety of ways. Can the Minister explain how every and all acts that threaten the economic well-being of the UK are a threat to national security, and why the wording that is used in the Investigatory Powers Act 2016 is not used here? For example, with regard to the issuing of bulk interception warrants, section 138 brackets 2, of the 2016 Act, where the issue of a warrant has to be in the interests of the economic well-being of the United Kingdom, but only so far as those interests are relevant to the interests of national security. <coughs> Excuse me, my lords. My lords. Uh, we've already debated a number of points in relation to the new ports powers under Schedule 3 to this Bill, and there are further groups of amendments to come which will address other aspects of these provisions. So that being the case, I will limit my re remarks in responding to this stand part debate to explaining the overarching case for these new powers to combat hostile state activity. <coughs> Schedule 3 will serve to address a current gap in our ability to tackle the threat from hostile state actors by introducing provisions that allow an examining officer to stop, question, search and detain persons at a UK port or the border area in Northern Ireland to determine whether they are or have been engaged in hostile activity. For the purposes of this legislation, a person is or has been engaged in hostile activity if they are or have been concerned in the commission, preparation or instigation of a hostile act that is or may be carried out for on behalf of a state other than the UK or otherwise in the interests of a state other than the United Kingdom. An act is an, a hostile act if it threatens national security, threatens the economic well-being of the UK, or is an act of serious crime. The noble um, uh, lady, Lady Jones, asks about um, what, uh, what might be the types of activity that would uh, threaten the economic well-being of the UK. Acts that would threaten the economic well-being of the UK would include acts that damage the country's critical infrastructure or disrupt energy supplies to the UK. And the power absolutely will not be used to target the legitimate activity of foreign businesses, um, as, as the noble Lord, Lord Paddock gave an example of. Um, the noble lady, Lady Jones, also asked, will the power be used uh, in a discriminatory uh, fashion? Um, the answer is, is very emphatically no, because selection based solely on ethnicity, religion or other protected characteristics is quite clearly unlawful. Selection for examination will be informed by a number of uh, considerations, including available intelligence uh, from, uh, from hostile activity and the select, select criteria in the draft code. The events, my lords, in um, Salisbury were a stark reminder of the impact that hostile activity can have on the safety and the security of our communities. The use of military-grade nerve agent on UK soil demonstrated very clearly the lengths that hostile actors, such as the Russian state, will go to in order to achieve their legitimate ends. 
my Lords, we shouldn't underestimate this threat. The Director General of MI5, Andrew Parker, set out the position in stark terms in a speech delivered in Berlin in May. He said, we are living in a period where Europe faces sustained hostile activity from certain states. Let me be clear, by this I mean deliberate and targeted malign activity intended to undermine our free, open and democratic societies, to destabilise international rules-based system that underpins our stability, security and prosperity. Chief protagonist amongst these hostile actors is the Russian government. My Lords, it's not often that the general public is so exposed to the work of hostile actors. These actions that highlight the contempt for public safety, the rule of law and international norms are consistent with the activities of Russian state and others that our operational partners uh, work tirelessly to counter. In introducing uh, new powers, the government seeks to provide the additional capability needed to better detect uh, disrupt and deter the threats from these hostile actors. As the noble Lord Lord Anderson put it in his evidence to Hask in January, if it is accepted that we need powers to stop and examine people at ports to combat terrorism, should not the police have similar powers to stop people on a similar basis who pose an equal but different threat to national security? In the government's view, the answer to that question must be an unequivocal yes. It is worth reiterating, my Lords, that the provisions of Schedule 3 are not entirely novel. They will in many respects mirror existing powers to stop and question persons at the border to determine whether they are terrorists, but will instead be used to determine whether the person is or has been engaged in hostile state activity. The Government is not saying that simply because we have these powers for counter-terrorism it just justifies expanding them to hostile activity. Rather, we're saying that we've experienced exercising these powers. We already know the vital role that they play in countering the activities of terrorists, and we've taken into account the views of the independent reviewer of terrorism legislation on the exercise of these powers to ensure that the subject of an examination is appropriately safeguarded. The noble Lord, Lord, Lord Paddock asked me exam uh, what examples of, of hostile activity that would not be considered a serious crime or even captured under current UK law or constitute terrorism. Um, un un unauthorised disclosure, um, that's the, uh, under the Official Secrets Act of 1990, uh, 1989, foreign intelligence officers, um, building relationships with government officials with plans to influence decision making or recruiting them as an agent, uh, foreign intelligence officers re receiving protectively marked information, stealing research plans, for example, of the UK's next uh, aircraft carrier. The, the Theft Act of 1968, Section 1, is applicable to tangible and in-action property, but doesn't cover information. So it may be possible to prosecute a person for theft of the medium on which sensitive information is recorded. However, the offence would carry limited uh, sentencing. Uh, finally, my Lords, I have to say that the threat to this country from hostile state activity is greater now than it has ever been, and it's therefore vitally important that the police are equipped to disrupt and deter such activity. Lady sits down. Um, I haven't quite understood, because if these stops by border guards are going to be based on intelligence, why don't they need reasonable suspicion? Because, my lords, I think we went through this the other day, because uh, officers may have fragmented pieces of information which do not amount to reasonable suspicion, uh, but they may, um, they may, may actually show uh, a, a pattern of uh, information emerging. Uh, I have to say that um, that, that may not reach the reasonable suspicion threshold. You can't just stop, uh, as she said, black people um, in, in a kind of stop and search type of, 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 of manner. Um, you have to have, you can't have an arbitrary uh, stop procedure. You, there, has, there has to be um, some rationale 
for uh, stopping that person. It is not arbitrary, uh, but it does not meet the threshold of reasonable suspicion. Can I, I'm grateful to the noble Baroness, the Minister. Can I put this as an example to her? Somebody is coming through a port of entry and their passport is examined. And in the moment when it is examined, it becomes apparent that there is something about the passport that doesn't look quite right, like it has very few entries in it, whereas the person concerned looks a very sophisticated traveller. Isn't that the sort of thing that falls well short of being reasonable suspicion, but is a proper exercise of the ability of good officers to use intelligence which is applied in the moment? Yeah. It uh, provides a very good example in, in that instance. It's that type of thing. It may not amount to reasonable suspicion, but there's certainly a pattern of uh, activity or uh, information which, 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 which would allow that officer to stop that individual. Could I just ask the noble baroness to, to answer the question I asked about why the wording uh, from the Investigatory Powers Act 2016 which attaches to uh, economic well-being of the United Kingdom the further condition that um, so far as those interests are also relevant in the in, uh, to the interests of national security. To differentiate between an act which is, uh, as she dis uh, an, an, an act that I described of uh, uh, envoys from Paris and Frankfurt trying to steal UK business and uh, the example that the noble baroness gave of somebody who was looking to target the electricity infrastructure and could I also ask the, cl uh, the clarification for what the minister said about the fact that these powers could not be used to target people on the basis of race and religion because that would be illegal um, in which case, can she explain why a police stop and search in one force area is 20 or 25 times more likely to be stopped and searched if you're from a, a black or minority ethnic background than if you are white? Why is that happening when that is illegal? Well, in terms of police stop and search, uh, police stop and search is... Um is, is, is very, very often uh, intelligence-based. Um, there, there, there may be areas where there is a higher um, than average proportion of uh, black people there. Uh, quite often, some of the gang activity is is, is black on black. Um, but but the but but no, you cannot be you cannot be stopped because you are black. Uh, the, the, the force I'm quoting from is Dorset, if that helps the noble <laughs> Baroness, the Minister. <laughs> that does help me, and of course it's where the noble lady Baroness Jones uh, lives. Um, but yes, no, that, that, the, the, noble, the noble lord makes, makes a very good point in, 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 that, in that instance. Um, in terms of envoys trying to steal business, there is nothing wrong with healthy business competition, but the but the economic undermining uh, the the economy uh, in, through the critical in infrastructure is an entirely uh, different uh, thing altogether. Um, he also asked me about um, the IP Act. Um, I I don't think actually. Um, I could, may, may I write to the noble uh, lord on? Yeah, oh, I've got, a, I've got an answer here. Um, if, so, if, if schedule, um, I'll just quote the noble lord, Lord Anderson, um, on this. If schedule seven has been skillfully used, one expect it to exercise uh, its exercise to be ethically proportionate, not to the UK population or even to the airport using population, but rather to the terrorist population that tra travels through UK ports. Far more eloquent uh, description of uh, the proportionality. But if I could write to him on the IP Act point, I will. It may help the House to, think, to focus on this as a counter-espionage issue. In the years I've been here, we've had, as I said at um, second reading, endless debates and legislation on terrorism. We're now talking about something that was part of my career 40 years, 30 years ago. 
And the noble Lord uh, Paddock, in suggesting, as rightly so, that the murder of the Shipples was murder and a serious crime, there's a range of hostile activity, much of which has been mentioned by the noble lady, the minister, which is potentially seriously damaging to the UK. At one end, obviously, the Scripples, coercive repatriation, but before that, collection of information, targeting dissidents, collecting in really important stuff, which is, is difficult sometimes to detect. And in answering, which I shouldn't, Lord Rosser, I suspect this won't be a very frequent occurrence, I suspect, but it's, as we heard from my successor but one in MI5, this is an increasing and serious problem. And this is an attempt by the government to address a counter-espionage issue. If I may say at this stage, because I have a, a commitment this evening, which may not mean that I can stay to the end of this important debate, there is also a problem that there's quite a lot of this activity which is not serious crime. Under the Official Secrets Act, which are a bit like me, old and creaky, and possibly some of your lordships, <laughs> they are not adequate. I've encouraged to see in the House of Commons, on, was it, I've got the reference here, on the 5th of September, that the Prime Minister suggested some espionage legislation was necessary to bring this subject up to date. I look forward to seeing whether that materialises or not. And it would be quite interesting to know whether this is regarded as a patch, temporary or long term, to some of those other problems. But the later amendments, trying to wish this all a serious crime, I'm afraid won't work, mm. because Official Secrets Act offences only get two years maximum, serious crime starts at three years. So yeah. there's a gap which we've got to attempt to fill. Well, I thank the noble lady for her very experienced and very helpful uh, comments there. Um, on her point about is this a patch or have we sort of th thought further ahead, obviously in, in legislation that we do uh, bring forward, we try to look at future threats, um, but who is to know what emerging, emerging uh, threats uh, might, might be in the future? Um, for example, um, cy clearly cyber crime is a, is a hugely uh, growing threat to us, uh, but, I, but I do thank her for that. those very helpful clar clarifications. And on that note, I beg to move. The question is that Clause 21, as amended, stand part of the Bill. As many as are there, many will say content. The contrary, not content. The contents have it. After Clause 21, Amendment 60, Lord Barnsford. Um, my Lord, um, in this country we allow, in moving Amendment 61, I think, is it? 61. Sorry, Amendment 61. Um, in moving Amendment 61, I'd like to point out that in this country we allow, and quite rightly so, UK passport holders to be in the possession of passports of other countries, not just one, two or three, whatever is needed. And when someone applies for a UK passport, they are required to declare what other passports they hold. But astonishingly, this information is not kept in any sort of central database, and still less is it available to border officers whose responsibility it is to examine passports of those entering or leaving the UK. This, of course, is why my noble friend, the Minister, um, we had to give me a written answer on the 16th of April this year when I asked about a register of second passports. Quote, no statistical information is available showing whether British citizens hold other citizenships. It's about five years ago when I was tipped off by a member of the security service that they found their operations made much more difficult by the fact that UK citizens were using their UK passport to travel to one destination and then another passport to get up to mischief perhaps in third countries. This was and is particularly relevant to would-be jihadists who travel perhaps to Pakistan 
and then attend training camps or indeed join Al-Qaeda or ISIS or some other terrorist organization in other countries. I remember a couple of years ago raising this point with Cressida Dick, the present Commissioner of Metropolitan Police, who was at that time responsible for anti-terrorist operations. And she expressed astonishment that border control officers were not automatically alerted to other passports held when a UK passport was electronically scrutinized at the point of entry. So my Amendment 61 is exceedingly modest. It merely asks that the government require dual nationals to declare other passports and that this information should be made available to border security staff and other relevant national authorities by a centralized database. In fact, it's even more modest because all I'm asking to do them to do is to study whether this is a sensible idea. Um, that's not asking very much. It is no more difficult or complicated than many other country centralized databases, such as the DVLA for vehicles and licenses and, and all the rest of it, and the National Firearms Licensing Managing System, which central, uh, the Central Firearm Register which I caused to be introduced as section 29 of the Firearms Amendment No. 2 Act 1997, which finally came into operation in September 2007 and is working very well. I checked quite recently with my own uh, county fire office, uh, firearms office. Now, there are three arguments which the government has previously used to oppose what I'm proposing. First, that it would be an infringement of civil liberties. Well, my answer to that is that such a concept of civil liberties is wholly outdated in an age when we are all subject to intense and often intrusive surveillance by foreign powers such as Russia and rather more efficiently China. Second, there could be no way of enforcing a declaration of other passports. Well, that, of course, uh, has a very simple remedy, which is, if it was declared to be deliberate and pernicious, the forfeiture of a UK passport when it is discovered. And I am quite sure, and maybe noble lords here will have their own view on this, that the great majority of second passport holders would not have the slightest objection to this being known to the authorities. After all, we all have to put up with a lot of very inconvenient baggage, baggage examination uh, under the existing counter-terrorist operations. Nor should we neglect the possibility of connivance by Home Office staff in com committing terrorist or other serious criminal offences, whether in connection with passports or border control. The Minister will be well aware that in the last 12 years, no fewer than 54 members of the Home Office staff have been sent to prison, sometimes for long periods, 9, 11 years, and in a recent case of Shamsu Iqbal, an official in the Immigration Department of the Home Office, who in April this year was sentenced to 15 years for misconduct in public office. Sometimes this involves selling visas or trafficking in passports, assisting illegal immigration, forgery, bribery, money laundering and other serious matters. And only today the newspapers are carrying a report of a Mr. Pellet, an officer in the Home Office Border Force who has just been found guilty of assisting criminal gangs to smuggle in weapons and drugs at Dover. So I suggest the Home Office really cannot argue that we can rely on their existing standards of efficiency, let alone integrity, in the protection of our borders. The third argument is that we should have confidence in the Home Office. Its intelligence-led 
processes and not concern ourselves with these matters. I think, I'm sure my noble friend doesn't feel this, but I think Home Office officials regard me as pretty impertinent to be talking about these matters. On that I would simply say, it is now 12 years since the noble Lord, Lord Reed, declared when he was Home Secretary that the Home Office was not fit for purpose. And it is only this month that the House of Commons Select Committee concluded in the matter of my right honourable friend Amber Rudd that the Home Office had lost its grip. My Lords, this simple and modest proposal is, I believe, necessary for national security. I believe it will improve the bill and I hope the government will show that it has some inclination to get a grip by adopting it. I beg to move. Amendment proposed. After clause 21, insert the new clause as printed in the Marshall list. My Lords, I'm grateful to my noble friend Lord Marsford for raising this matter and I acknowledge his long-standing interest in this issue. I share my noble friend's aim of preventing those who may be of interest on the grounds of terrorism, serious crime or hostile activity from avoiding detection at the border. But, but before I reply substantively to him, I, may I just say that I believe the Home Office uh, to be blessed with many, many committed, honourable and very able civil servants. And I think it is wrong for this committee to gain the impression uh, that it is somehow uh, ru uh, shot through with, um, with those who would seek to disobey uh, the law. Uh, that is not my experience. It's certainly not the experience of my noble friend, uh, the Minister, or I dare say any of your Lordships in this House who've had dealings with the Home Office. Holding dual national status is, is perfectly lawful in the UK and it isn't a barrier to acquiring British citizenship or obtaining a British passport. When making such applications, dual nationals are required to provide the Home Office with details of any foreign passports or other nationality held. Such information will assist in the assessment of the application, including, in the case of an application for naturalisation, the assessment of any grounds for refusal based on conduct through past or present activities. The request for dual national passport information is also necessary in understanding whether a person is using one name for all official purposes. The UK, through the Home Office, has also instituted a policy that a person must have one name for all official purposes and that this is reflected in biometric residence permits, naturalisation and registration documents and passports. This policy is in place not only for travel purposes but also to frustrate the use of multiple names for access to goods and services. This, together with other measures in place, minimises the ability of a British citizen to manipulate travel documents to travel in and out of the UK and other countries undetected for terrorism, trafficking and other criminal activities. My noble friend has asked that the Home Secretary considers two issues. First, the case for dual national British citizens to declare the nationality of their other passport or passports. Secondly, the case of, for such information to be made available to border officials and other national authorities through a centralised database in order to assist with border security. Now, on the first issue, I've already indicated that when a dual national makes an application for a new replacement or renewal British passport, Her Majesty's Passport Office will always ask the person if the person holds any other passports. Where names are inconsistent in these passports to that being applied for in their British passport, the application will not be granted unless the person aligns their names or meets one of the limited exceptions. An exception is granted for gender change where this is not recognised by the other country to comply with the Equalities, Equalities Act um, 2010. But any other exception where granted requires the applicant to have an, an observation added to their British passport detailing the name and nationality 
of their dual national passport. Should such a person fail to disclose at the point of application for a British passport that they hold a passport under another nationality, they would be committing a criminal offence by making a false statement on the application form, and the Home Office would consider withdrawing or refusing to issue a British passport. That would be considered on the individual circumstances of the case and the seriousness of the consequences of the attempted deception. Now, I recognise my noble friend's concern about preventing those people who seek to cause harm to this country or our allies from being able to travel in and out of countries on different passports. The committee will be aware that the statement setting out the policy on exercising royal prerogative powers in relation to passports was updated by the Home Secretary on uh, the 25th of April 2013. In her statement to the House of Commons, the then Home Secretary made clear the importance of being able to refuse or withdraw passport facilities from British nationals who may seek to harm the UK or its allies by travelling on a British passport to, for example, engage in terrorist-related or other serious or organised criminal activity. The Government went further in the Counter-Terrorism and Security Act 2015, which provided new powers to deal with the problem of foreign fighters and prevent radicalisation. This provided powers to the police to temporarily seize the passports of those suspected of leaving the UK in connection with terrorism-related activity. In some cases, this led to longer-term disruptive action, such as use of royal prerogative powers, to cancel British passports. I hope that my noble friend will agree that a person's identity is of primary importance and that safeguards are already in place to ensure that when differences in dual nationals' personal details are identified, alignment is required prior to the issue of a British passport. Information and documentation, including foreign passports, provided when making a passport application, is recorded and available to others through existing data sharing agreements. My Lords, turning to my noble friend's second point, he's suggested that information on dual or multiple passport holders should be made available to law enforcement agencies through a central database. Border security staff already have access to British passport and intelligence information. And if there is a person of specific interest, they can access full details on immigration and passport history through current records. Where provided, this will include any declared dual national passports. We believe that this targeted approach makes the best use of border force resources and provides a relevant timely and proportionate use of HM Passport Office data on dual nationality. This approach is compliant with the data protection principles as laid down in the General Data Protection Regulation and the Data Protection Act 2018 and respects those principles of data minimisation. Of course, a person can change their name by deed poll or with overseas authorities at any time. However, we don't believe that a requirement to inform UK authorities of name changes or of the acquisition or loss of other nationality will make those seeking to hide their identity more likely to provide such information. That is why we believe that the use of facial matching, biometrics and other security checks focus on identifying individuals and tying them to an identity rather than simply seeking to monitor the travel documents they hold um, is a more effective safeguard. In the UK, in aligning names for all official purposes or adding different names as observations where names are not aligned assists other countries as well as the UK to identify British citizens who may be seeking to use more than one identity. Furthermore, as we've indicated to my noble friend when he has pursued this issue on previous occasions, we are clear that setting up any additional database on dual nationals would be of limited value. 
we've seen no evidence to indicate that a dual national database would enhance security at our ports, nor has it been requested by any security, intelligence or border agency. Moreover, there's no reason to believe that the study envisaged by this amendment would reach a different conclusion. So, my lords, I hope my noble friend will agree that there are steps already in place to deal with the concerns that he's raised. I am satisfied that the existing processes which focus on identity and recording dual nationality and passports when required provide the necessary safeguards. Importantly, mechanisms are already in place to share that data with relevant national agencies, including border staff, in a proportional and targeted approach. As part two of the bill demonstrates, we're ready to strengthen the powers we need to protect our borders where a compelling operational case has been made and the investment required represents value for money. But we don't believe that a case currently exists for a database of dual nationals. I know this will come as a disappointment to my noble friend, but I hope he would nevertheless be content to withdraw his amendment. My Lord, I have great sympathy with my noble friend for having to read out a Home Office response, which of course completely misses the point of my amendment. The point of my amendment is that when people hold more than one passport, and when a passport is scanned, the fact that they've got other passports is automatically revealed. Very simple. Very simple to do and very necessary, because that may well give the clue in certain cases, not many cases, you don't need many cases for these things to be worthwhile, um, of a need for follow-up. So I'm afraid I must ask, I, must, I will of course withdraw the amendment for the moment, but I must ask the Home Office to look at what I'm actually proposing, because a great deal of what my noble friend read out was wholly irrelevant to the point that I'm trying to make. But in, having said that, I, I withdraw the amendment for the moment. Has amendment be withdrawn? Amendment by leave withdrawn. Amendment 62, Baroness Jones, Lord Moscow. Uh, my Lords, I rise to move my Amendment 62, which would require a consultation on the right to protest and to undertake peaceful, non violent direct action. And I feel this is a very personal amendment for me because I do go to protests and peaceful protests and it's possible that some members of your Lordship's House have as well, although looking round, possibly not. Um, now, I'm compelled to bring this amendment for personal reasons, but also in the knowledge of the Stansted 15, who are undergoing a criminal trial for heroically trying to stop deportations in response to the Windrush scandal and the government's now discredited hostile environment policy. I also bring this amendment in the name of all environmental protectors who are harassed by armies of police and private security in the fight against fracking. This includes the fracking three who were thrown in jail by a judge who had a family ties to the oil and gas supply chain. They were later freed by the Court of Appeal. I also want to highlight the tree protectors in Sheffield who spent years trying to stop the council from felling thousands of healthy trees. They faced rough tactics by the police and the Council have taken unprecedented steps which risk bankrupting individual protesters. And of course I want to pay my respects to all environmental protectors in the UK and around the world who face persecution and prosecution for the crime of protecting our planet. Uh, a noble lord said earlier something about civil liberties are outdated. Well, not in my world they're not. And I would argue that if we want to live in a democratic society, then civil liberties are an absolutely crucial component of that. And there is a common thread that runs all, all through the cases that I mentioned just now. That thread is the use and abuse of laws which stamp out legal peaceful protest, whether it's terrorism legislation at Stansted, obstruction of the highway in Lancashire, or trade union legislation in Sheffield, we've seen time and again that the state will use the law creatively to deter and punish those who put their bodies on the line to fight injustice and environmental destruction. There is the emerging application of civil injunctions, which mean that companies and councils can bankrupt people for exercising their right to protest, even when they haven't broken the law. Environmental protesters and campaigners have faced persecution in other ways too. 
We know that we've often been designated as domestic extremists and put into the same category as far-right neo-Nazis and the man who murdered the MP Joe Cox. We've been spied upon by the police, had our campaigns infiltrated by police officers. Some of us have even been deceived by police into forming sexual relationships as part of forming their cover stories. The sense of state intrusion in our lives is difficult to convey and undoubtedly puts many people off from taking part in protests. And we have, of course, seen our causes proved right with time. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said that even if we do meet the targets in the Paris Climate Agreement, which is unlikely, we will still see catastrophic consequences. And the anti-fracking movement, once mocked for their suggestions that fracking would cause earthquakes, has been proved right by Quadrilla causing dozens of quakes in the vicinity of their fracking site in Lancashire. Those quakes have repeatedly breached the upper limits set by the government's own gold standard fracking regulations. And the government's own response to this has been to change their myth-busting fact sheet from saying fracking doesn't cause earthquakes to fracking doesn't cause serious earthquakes. If the suffragettes were alive today, they would be standing alongside us as domestic extremists facing trumped-up criminal sanctions for doing the right thing. And I'm sure that with time, history will recognise the environmental movement as forcing the same scale of social change as the suffragettes are credited with today. For all of these reasons, my amendment would require the government to conduct a consultation of the impact of this bill on the right to protest and to consult on a statutory system for designating people as domestic extremists. I believe that this is an essential first step towards enshrining a true right to protest in the UK and recognising that people should have legal defences when they're acting in protection of the environment and human rights. The powers in this bill would add to the already long list of laws which can be used or abused against honest, dedicated campaigners, and that must be opposed. I beg to move. Opposed. Oh, Insert the new clauses, please, on the Marshall list. Uh, just uh, very briefly, Amendment 62 proposed by the noble lady, Baroness Jones and Muscombe, seeks to add a new clause. Article 21 concerning the right to protest. Um, now, the right to protest peacefully is an extremely important right that we should all cherish. And um, I've been on a few marches myself and protests over the, over over the time. And uh, who's gone for a, with a few friends, stand up for what you believe in. And um, there are many many of my friends on on, on my noble friends in in, in in my party certainly been have been on a few marches their time. I'm sure many noble lords and other and other part of the bench have been as well. Uh, I don't, any one group has got sort of um, a claim that they are the, the partly the marches, the protests. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I, but I, you know, but I, I do think that um, when uh, the government do respond to this issue, I think it is an important one because I do think the, the right to protest is is an important right that we all should cherish. And as I said before, I, mean, I, I, I generally have agreed with the bill before the House, and, uh, and I'm happy to support the bill. And I, I do accept that we are giving the government some quite, you know, quite uh, uh, extra powers here. But uh, you know, the, the reason I'm supporting this generally is because I think the, the idea that they're quite a narrow focus to deal with some very, very important matters. So I do hope that we can get some assurance from the government on that point, because I, think, because I, thought, I would, would want to see is anything in this bill used to stop people peacefully protesting. That's very important. We shouldn't have that. I think the noble is a point about domestic extremism. That is a very, very important issue, you know. And um, now I like the noble lady about Jones very much, and uh, we get on. And sometimes we agree on things, but sometimes we don't agree on things. Uh, I would not regard her as a domestic extremist. I think she's a campaigner, an honourable member of the House, and makes, makes a very valuable contribution. I think it's important that people have that right, and shouldn't be branded or, you know, somebody grouped together that there's some way their rights are taken away and things. So I think it's important that, you know, that, you know, we clear that there are there are dangerous people in this country. To be clear, people born here can be very dangerous, and they can be from the hard right to the hard left or other groups and stuff, or, or religious extremists. And we need to have the laws in place to deal with those people, but at the same time enshrined protecting the rest of us our right to protest and stand up with what we believe in. I look forward to the response of the government on these matters. Could I just say yeah. to the noble Lord, uh, Lord Kennedy, I was not trying to sort of corner the market in, <laughs> in protest. I was just thinking perhaps, you know, a lot, a lot of um, members here might not have the time to do that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
Well, I, I wasn't going to, to speak. Um, I, um, perhaps I should declare an interest. I have been probably to more protests than any other member of this House, but mainly in uniform, rather than, uh, than uh, uh, to, to protest myself. What I'm struggling uh, with this amendment is to, to understand which particular part of the bill that the, the noble baroness is concerned about that would directly impact on peaceful protest. Um, which is why I hesitated to, uh, to make a contribution. Uh, uh, my concern is that this is a repressive piece of legislation, and what we're already finding is that peaceful protest is heavily affected by other parts of terrorism legislation, and therefore I think that this would have an impact as well. My Lords, I am grateful to the Noble Baroness Lady Jones for setting out the case for this new clause. And I would like to reassure her, and I hope I can, that the provisions contained within the bill will not impact on an individual's right to peacefully protest. And let me say without ifs or buts, this is a right central to a free and democratic society such as ours, and one which we would all seek to uphold and defend. The Noble Baroness Lady Manningham Buller argued in second reading, and I quote her words, there is no, li no liberty without security. Um, and with due respect to the Noble Baroness, I'm inclined to agree. Um, the, the measures in the bill are intended to ensure that the fundamental rights and values held so dearly by the vast majority of individuals in this country are upheld, and that people are able to express their views and stand up for what they believe in the face of a malign and growing terrorist threat. While we saw the ultimate expression of these hateful views in Finsbury Park, in Westminster, <coughs> London Bridge, Manchester, um, these attitudes also undermine the cohesion of our communities, restrict our freedoms and diminish our rights, in particular those of women and girls. I should make clear that the type of conduct which the provisions in the bill are aimed at concerns support for proscribed organisations, organisations which are by definition <coughs> concerned with terrorism. There is a clear public interest in stymieing support for terrorist organisations, since the more support they have, the stronger their capacity to engage in terrorism. But the provisions in the bill would not extend to support for other organisations which are not prescribed, uh, or indeed to expressions of support for causes which are neither terrorist nor otherwise illegal. Tackling the evil ideology of extremism is one of the greatest challenges of, of our time, and we need a new approach to identifying, exposing and defeating it. And this year, to step up the fight against extremists, we established an independent commission for countering extremism. It is crucial to bringing new drive and innovative thinking to all our efforts to tackle extremism. Our published charter sets out the Commission's status as a transparent organisation operating independently from government and provides it with a clear remit to support the government to identify and confront extremist ideology in all its forms, whether Islamists, Islamist or far and extreme right wing, or violent uh, and non-violent. It also confirms that the Commission will have no remit on counter-terrorism policies, including prevent. In its first year, the Commission is engaging widely and openly and undertaking an intensive evidence-gathering phase to inform advice to government on new policies to counter extremism. This will include revisiting the extremism definition. The Commission has now engaged with over 400 experts and activists and in, December, in, in September I'm sorry, published the terms of reference for their study. This will be informed by an open public consultation, evidence from government and further research. I would urge everyone to engage with the Commission in this vital effort. My Lords, peaceful protest is a vital part of a democratic society. It is a long-standing tradition in this country that people are free to gather together and to demonstrate their views. 
however uncomfortable these may be to the majority of us, provided that they do so within the law. Articles 9, 10 and 11 of the ECHR form the basis of an individual's right to participate in peaceful protest. There is, of course, a balance to be struck. Protesters' rights need to be balanced with the rights of others to go about their business without fear of intimidation or serious disruption to the community. Rights to peaceful protest do not extend to violent or threatening behaviour and the police have powers to deal with any such acts. However, these powers are not contained within counter-terrorism legislation, but in the Public Order Act 1986. Under the Public Order Act 1986, Chief Officers of Police may impose conditions on assemblies and public processions to prevent serious public disorder, serious damage to property, or serious disruption to the life of the community. The directions can relate to the du duration, location and size of any demonstration. If police assess a march will cause serious public disorders despite conditions being set, the police can apply to the local council for an order prohibiting the holding of a public procession for a period of up to three months. The council must obtain the consent of the Home Secretary before making a banning order. In the London area, the Metropolitan Police Commissioner would need to apply to the Home Secretary for consent to ban the march. The police must not prevent, hinder or restrict peaceful assembly, except to the extent allowed by Article 11.2 of the ECHR. They must not impose unreasonable indirect restrictions on persons exercising their rights to peaceful assembly, for example, imposing a condition on the location of a protest, which effectively negates the purpose of the protest. Preemptive measures taken by the police which restrict the exercise of the right to peaceful assembly will be subject to particular scrutiny. In certain circumstances, the police have a duty to take reasonable steps to protect those who want to exercise their rights peacefully. This applies where there is a threat of disruption or disorder from others. This does not mean that there is an absolute duty to protect those who want to protest, but the police must take reasonable measures in particular circumstances. Now, my Lords, following debate at committee stage in the House of Commons, my colleague, the Security Minister, undertook to consider amendments designed to prevent charges being levied on the organisers of a public procession or assembly should an anti-terrorism traffic regulation order be required to protect such an event. The Government brought forward an amendment to Clause 15 of the Bill to achieve this. My Lords, we did this so as not to restrict the right to peaceful protest, as we believe that people should not be charged to exercise these fundamental human rights. Prior to introduction of the Bill in the House of Commons, the Home Secretary made a statement that, in his view, the provisions of the Bill are compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights. This is a view which I shared uh, when the Bill, uh, when, well, my noble friend shared, uh, when the Bill was introduced to this House. Given all this, and the scrutiny the Bill has received during its passage through bo both Houses, as well as by the Joint Committee on Human Rights and the Constitution Committee, I'm not persuaded that the consultation exercise envisaged by Amendment 62 is necessary. I hope that with that somewhat lengthy um, explanation, um, and having had the opportunity to debate this important topic, the noble Baroness will be content to withdraw her amendment for the time being. Thank you. If your Lordship's pleasure, this amendment be withdrawn. Amendment by Lee withdrawn. Amendment 63, Lord Marks, only on Thames. Uh, my Lords, uh, this amendment 63 is in my name and that of uh, my noble friend Lord Paddock and the noble Lords Lord Rosser and Lord Kennedy of Southwark. Uh, our amendment would amend Schedule 8 of the Terrorism Act to protect the right of a person detained or questioned under Section 41 of that Act, that is on suspicion of being a terrorist, or Schedule 7, which is concerned with questioning at ports and borders. 
uh, and the right is to consult a solicitor and to do so without delay and in private. The first and third parts of our amendment in subparagraphs 2 and 4 would amend paragraph 7.1 and omit paragraph 9 of Schedule 8. Paragraph 7.1 presently provides, subject to two exceptions to which I'll turn in a moment, that the person so detained shall be entitled, if he so requests, to consult a solicitor as soon as is reasonably practical, privately and at any time. The two exceptions to the entitlement under paragraph 71 are first, the power to delay a consultation with a solicitor. Under paragraph 8, an officer of the rank of superintendent or higher may authorise a delay in permitting the detained person to consult a solicitor in certain prescribed circumstances. The second is a restriction on the right to consult in private, which we suggest is central to the right to confidential advice. Under paragraph 9, a direction by a police officer of the rank of commander or assistant chief constable or above may in certain circumstances provide that a detained person who wishes to consult a solicitor may only do so, and I quote, in the sight and hearing of a qualified officer. The specified circumstances for the application of both exceptions are, and I paraphrase, where the lack of such a direction may lead to any number of risks, any of a number of risks. Those risks uh, include damage to evidence of a serious offence, interference with or physical injury to any person, alerting other suspects, hindering the recovery of property obtained as a result of a serious offence, hindering information gathering or investigation, alerting someone as to, to, to an investigation so as to make it more difficult to prevent an act of terrorism, alerting someone so as to make it more difficult to apprehend, prosecute or convict a person of commission, preparation or instigation of an act of terrorism. Now our amendment would, and we say significantly, leave the exception under paragraph 8 relating to the power to delay a consultation in the specified circumstances but we would remove the exception under paragraph 9, that is, the denial of the right to a consultation in private. And, my Lords, we are clear in our view that it is fundamental to the right to consult a solicitor that the consultation should indeed be in private. The Joint Committee on Human Rights considered this question in its second report, and they said in the section on access to a lawyer in respect of Schedule 3 of this Bill, uh, at paragraphs 55 and 56. They said as follows. In some cases, the detainee may only consult a solicitor in the sight and hearing of a qualified officer. The government explains that this restriction exists to disrupt and deter a detainee who seeks to use their legal privilege to pass on instructions to a third party, either through intimidating their solicitor or passing on a coded message. We recognise these concerns, but consider that there are more proportionate ways of mitigating these risks, such as pre-approval of vetted panels of lawyers. We suggest further consideration be given to alternative options so that timely and confidential legal advice can be given to all persons stopped and detained under these powers. My Lords, it is profoundly regrettable that the government seems to have fallen into a habit of cavalier disregard of the recommendations of that very distinguished and largely consensual cross-party committee of both houses. I echo the regret expressed by my noble friend Baroness Hamwe at second reading at some of the disparaging remarks made by the Minister Ben Wallace MP, the Security Minister, in the House of Commons about that committee. My Lords, this is what the Law Society said in objecting to the proposals in the Bill on the point. Legal professional privilege is a cornerstone of the Constitution and the rule of law in this country. It guarantees that individuals can consult a legal representative in confidence, underpinning the right to a fair trial and access to justice. This privilege belongs to clients, not lawyers. Not only is legal privilege central to the protection of the rights of individuals, 
the ability to access a fair and efficient legal system is the reason why our law and jurisdiction are used throughout the world. My Lords, the second part of our amendment in subparagraph 3 would amend paragraph 7a of Schedule 8 of the Terrorism Act, which prevents questioning of a person detained for questioning at ports and borders. And I quote, until the person has consulted a solicitor, bracket, or no longer wishes to do so. That consultation must generally be a consultation in person. Those protections are subject to two exceptions. The first is that the entitlement to consult a solicitor does not apply if the examining officer reasonably believes that postponing the questioning until a solicitor has been consulted would prejudice determination of the matters under investigation. The second is that the consultation need not be in person if the examining officer reasonably believes that the time it would take to consult a solicitor in, in person would be likely to prejudice that determination. Our amendment would remove the exception for reasonable suspicion that consulting a solicitor might risk the determination of the matters under investigation. It is, I suggest, far too easy for an officer to come to that view and the right to consult a solicitor is too fundamental to natural justice to allow a suspicion of possible prejudice to an investigation to displace it. And my Lords, one must remember that this paragraph uh, is concerned only with questioning at ports and borders where no suspicion of terrorism is necessary. It isn't uh, an investigation under Section 41 where there is suspicion uh, of terrorism. In relation to the right for a consultation to be in person, our amendment would remove the general and very broad exception for likely prejudice to the investigation, but would permit an exception in a more limited class of case where the examining officer reasonably believes that the delay involved in arranging a personal consultation would create an immediate risk of physical injury to any person. Finally, in relation to this amendment, the exception to the right to a consultation in person permits the examining officer, in a case where the exception applies, to require the consultation to take place in another way. Our amendment would add the proviso that such a requirement must ensure that the consultation will be in private. My Lords, before closing, I would also add my support for the amendments in this group, uh, numbers 83 to 88 inclusive, in the, noble, in the names of my noble friends, Lord Paddock and Baroness Hamley, and the noble Lords Rosser and Kennedy of Southwark. These are intended to protect the right of a person detained under Schedule 3 at a port or border area. Those amendments are recommended in exact terms by the Joint Committee on Human Rights, and I repeat my observations about the respect that ought to be accorded to the recommendations of that committee. We should always remember, my Lords, that in considering counter-terrorist legislation, a central aim of the legislation is to defend our democracy. Human rights, including the right to take timely and confidential legal advice, are fundamental to our democracy. They should only be limited where the case for their limitation is overwhelming, and that is one of the reasons why we have a Joint Committee on Human Rights. Otherwise, my Lords, the terrorists gain what they wish. These amendments, which the noble lady Baroness Hamley will explain in more detail, what you did. Baroness Hamley will explain in more detail, will confer a right on detained persons to be informed of their right to consult a solicitor when first detained, that's 83, would remove the right to delay a consultation with a solicitor, that's 84, would remove the exception to the right to have a consultation with a solicitor in private in circumstances parallel to those that apply under the Terrorism Act, by committing consultations in the sight and hearing of a qualified officer, or by Amendment 86 as an alternative would substitute a consultation in the sight of a qualified officer, but not in his or her hearing. My Lords, we firmly suggest that the Government should place a higher value on the importance to human rights of timely access to confidential legal advice from a solicitor in person. The, restriction in the ter restrictions in the Terrorism Act uh, and in this bill are disproportionate and should, I suggest, be amended uh, in the ways we propose. My Lords, I beg to move. Amendment proposed. Insert the new clause as printed on the Marshall List.
my lords, um, my noble friend's curtain raiser has covered a very great deal of, of the ground. Um, I speak to Amendments 83, 84, 85, 87 and 88, which come from the Joint Committee on Human Rights, um, to ensure that detainees under Schedule 3 of this Bill are informed of their rights and provided with timely and confidential legal advice in all four jurisdictions, and it's because there's more than one jurisdiction uh, that there's a number of, of amendments. We were concerned, we are concerned, that the safeguard of access to a lawyer is not adequately protected under this bill. In particular, it's not clear that an individual will even be informed of his right to request access. Um, apparently, this is only available on request. Access to a lawyer may not be available when a person is questioned initially, it may be delayed. It's not sufficient in our view to rely on a code of practice in this area. The legislation should be adequate in itself and as regards access, unqualified or very close to unqualified. I'll come to that in a moment. The um, uh, government told the um, committee that a code of practice would make clear that permission to seek legal advice should be permitted when reasonably practicable, and that, and I quote, a restriction, the restrictions are to mitigate the, against the possibility of an examination being obstructed or frustrated as a result of a detainee using his right to a solicitor. Leaving aside whether that second point is one we should accept, I don't think I do. Um, in, it, it's my view that the two statements are barely consistent or compatible. Um, my noble friend has, has quoted um, the um, uh, response from the um, government that legal privilege might be used to pass on instructions to a third party through intimidation or a coded message. Um, my lords, these powers restrict the restrictions unjustifiably interfere with the right to timely and confidential advice and therefore ultimately with the right to a fair trial if there is a prosecution. And I make that point because the Joint Committee approaches everything from the point of view of human rights and the right to a fair trial is one of those. There is not in the Bill sufficient safeguard against the arbitrary exercise of the powers the last time when I, that I recall the question of legal privilege being regarded as a problem by the government, I sat and listened in a minister's office to something like a seminar um, with him and two very um, senior uh, lawyers, both members of this house, both of whom are here uh, this afternoon, who articulated very effectively and authoritatively what I would describe as my own queasiness about the um, suggestion that um, um, access to a solicitor should be restricted. Um, the, um, they dealt very um, effectively, I thought, then with the safeguards that exist against dodgy lawyers, I put it like that, because after all, this issue is not peculiar to this situation. There have been, as my noble friend says, suggestions such as the pre-approval of vetted panels of lawyers. I'm not quite convinced, but we'll hear from the noble Lord, Lord Rosser, that the Labour Amendment 86 uh, meets the government's points or deals with the principle. But we do urge the government to consider how a client's fundamental human rights in this area should be protested, protected, because there are other ways of dealing with this. Um, although I, um, my name is not... I'm sorry. I'm out of order. I shouldn't have stood up then. <laughs> sorry. May, may I just invite the government to think rather carefully about this? This provision enables an individual 
to be stopped, to be detained, to be searched, true not an intimate search but a strip search, and for his or her property to be detained. It really should be elementary that he or she should be able to speak to a lawyer of some kind within the ambit of uh, the noble Lord, Lord Marx's uh, amendment, to, if only to be told, yes, they do have these powers. It would be rather a good idea for you to comply. The Lord's, uh, I, I too, am concerned about the subject, and I agree with the comments uh, that have been made. The right to confidential legal advice is fundamental uh, to the rule of law. Uh, the right to consult a solicitor is simply pointless uh, if it is not to take place uh, in private. The client uh, is not going to speak freely in those circumstances. Uh, therefore, any restrictions must be necessary and they must be uh, proportionate. And I agree with Lord Marx. It is vital to look for more proportionate means of addressing uh, the government's uh, legitimate uh, concerns uh, and a way forward, I agree with Lord Marx, uh, is to uh, adopt uh, an approach that the client ought to be able to speak freely to any uh, solicitor unless there are reasonable grounds to believe that that solicitor will not act in accordance with his or her professional obligations. Regrettably, there have been cases of such solicitors, but they're very few. Uh, and uh, it seems to me entirely disproportionate to prevent access to confidential legal advice because of the misbehaviour of a few rogue solicitors. We can deal with rogue solicitors in other ways. We too are obviously concerned about the issue of having a uh, right to have access to a solicitor um, and uh, my name and that of my noble friend Lord Kennedy um, are attached to um, all the amendments in this group but the one I wish to speak in particular about is amendment um, 86 uh, which uh, as the others do refers to legal professional privilege and to a person's ability to consult a lawyer in uh, private in relation to stops at the border and as has been said, there's a power in the bill for an officer not only to watch someone receiving legal advice, but to hear that legal advice being given. Um, there were concerns raised by the government when the matter was discussed in the Commons. And uh, the first argument that was advanced by the government was that rather than contacting a lawyer, a person might contact someone they wanted to notify of the fact that they had been stopped. And the government also argued that that person might notify a lawyer who would not adhere to the professional standards that we would expect and who might uh, pass some information on. And I think the third argument that was advanced uh, was that of a lawyer inadvertently passing on a piece of information. And that appeared to be the guts of the uh, government's argument in favour of what is in the bill at the present time. And as the noble lady, the minister, will uh, know, uh, the shadow minister for security in the uh, Commons did put forward a proposition that there should be a panel of lawyers properly regulated, uh, he said, by the Solicitors Regulation Authority and the Law Society. I've subsequently found out that not necessarily all lawyers hold those organisations in complete awe. Um, that the principle was certainly one of having a panel of lawyers that was properly regulated. And in his response in the Commons, as I understand it, the uh, Minister for Security uh, said he thought the suggestion was a good one and promised to take it away and look at it. And uh, I hope in the light of that, that uh, we will be able to make some progress on this issue and that the noble lady, the minister on behalf of the government, uh, will be able to indicate some movement on the government's part, in fact, hopefully a great deal of movement on the government's part towards the objectives uh, of ensuring a right 
uh, to have legal advice, to have access to a solicitor, and have access to a solicitor in private. My Lords, the provisions relating to access to a lawyer, so far as they replicate those in Schedule 7, which I understand they are intended to do, uh, should be seen against the background of three matters. First, the maximum period under both schedules of six hours detention, which was reduced from nine hours a few years ago and from much longer periods uh, during the time of the Troubles, when, as now, uh, these controls could be applied to travellers between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, a long-standing example of a border down the Irish Sea. Secondly, the fact that some of these seaports and airports are remote and stops, let alone detentions, are so unusual uh, that it will be quite impracticable always to have a panel of lawyers uh, on uh, tap. Thirdly, the fact long considered obvious by the courts and now enshrined in Clause 16 of the Bill that answers given under these compulsory powers uh, may not be used in subsequent criminal proceedings, uh, save in the special circumstances outlined for Schedule 7 uh, by the Supreme Court in Begal and echoed in the Bill. The last of those factors caused Mr Justice Collins, in the case of CC 2012, to doubt whether there was any value at all in the presence of a lawyer during Schedule 7 questioning, since no responsible lawyer uh, could advise their client to break the law by remaining silent. That view was rejected by the Divisional Court in the case of Eloster, which held that, and I quote, the solicitor does have a useful, if limited, role to play, uh, close quotes. But the fact remains uh, that there are differences uh, between an examination under Schedule 3 or Schedule 7, on the one hand, and a classic police interview under caution. Uh, and it's perhaps also relevant just to have in mind that unless I'm mistaken, and I'm sure I'll be corrected if I am, uh, these equivalent powers appear not only under Schedule 7 to the Terrorism Act, but under Schedule 8, uh, where detention uh, for much longer periods of up to 14 days is uh, contemplated. Um, but before the Minister uh, thinks I've become too tame, uh, may I uh, please make this point. Uh, the operation of any powers to delay or impose limitations uh, on access to legal advice, if they are to continue and to be extended, must be subject to effective independent review. And this will only be possible if the reasons are recorded, as is correctly provided for in Schedule 3, uh, and if the number of occasions on which they have been used is published so that concerned citizens are aware and so that the independent reviewer uh, can investigate individual cases or indeed draw attention to and explore the reasons for any increasing trend in the use of the powers. The number of occasions on which access to a solicitor has been delayed to those detained under Schedule 8 is logged meticulously in Northern Ireland and published by the NIO in its annual statistics on terrorism legislation. The latest figures tell us that between uh, 2001 and March 2018, only five persons in Northern Ireland were refused immediate access to a solicitor. But effective review requires the equivalent figures to be available for the whole country. I was given to understand uh, four years ago uh, by the Home Office, not for the first time, uh, that this was work in progress, uh, at least where Schedule 8 was concerned. Uh, can the Minister undertake that the statistics relating to delayed and conditional access to a solicitor on the part of those detained under the Terrorism Act uh, and uh, the new hostile state activity powers will be published across the country? Uh, and will she tell us if there is anything she can do to speed things up a bit? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fixed. <laughs> <laughs> Ring the house and monitor it. Well, my Lords, could I thank Noble Lords who have made um, points on these amendments and in particular uh, to Noble Lord, Lord Marks. And I hope that um, at the end of my remarks that uh, Noble Lords uh, will be more satisfied um, as to uh, the, the, the progress of this bill in this area. My Lords, the amendments in this group raise the important issue of a detainee's right to access a solicitor when detained under the port's powers in Schedule 3 to the bill or Schedule 7 to the Terrorism Act of 2000. These amendments seek to ensure that when an individual has been detained under these schedules, the examining officer must postpone questioning until the examinee has consulted a solicitor in private. 
I am aware that the right to access a solicitor under these ports powers was a subject of much debate as this bill was scrutinised in the House of Commons, as the Lord Lord Rosser pointed out. The uh, very good speeches here at second reading served as a very fitting reminder that as new threats emerge, we must continue to be steadfast in our commitment to the principles that our laws and practices are founded upon. The powers under these schedules would afford any person who is formally detained the right to consult a solicitor privately if they request to do so. In the vast majority of cases where an individual has been detained under these powers, there will be absolutely no reason to interfere with that right. In exceptional circumstances, however, there may be a need for a more senior police officer to restrict that right where the officer has reasonable grounds for believing that allowing the detainee to exercise his or her right to consult a solicitor privately will have certain serious consequences. For example, interference with evidence or gathering of information, injury to no another person, alerting others that they are suspected of an indictable offence or hindering the recovery of property obtained by an indictable offence. My Lords, I've listened very carefully to the de debates this afternoon and it's clear that there are particular concerns about the restrictions under these schedules that would allow an Assistant Chief Constable to require the detainee to consult their solicitor within the sight and hearing of another police officer. If I explain that the intention behind this restriction is to disrupt a detainee who seeks to exploit their right to consult a solicitor by using the solicitor as a conduit to pass on instructions to a third party, either through intimidation, willing collusion or the use of a coded uh, message, as the noble Lord, Lord Marx pointed out. Reasonable grounds for belief might, be, might develop where prior intelligence indicates that an individual may seek to obstruct an examination either because they have a history of doing so or they have been trained to evade, frustrate or subvert police examinations. The officer must, might also witness interactions between the individual and their solicitor that alerts them to the possibility that the detainee is intimidating their solicitor. Now, amendments 85, 86 and 88 and the equivalents within the new clause introduced through Amendment 63 would see these restrictions removed from Schedule 3 and 7 in their entirety. I understand the rationale for these amendments and I recognise the force of the arguments that have been made in defence of the principle of lawyer-client confidentiality. At the same time, of course, we are all here because we recognise uh, the threat that we face from hostile state actors and terrorists and the risk of leaving loopholes to be exploited. During the debate, um, as the Noble Lord, Lord Rosser, uh, alluded to um, in the in, at report stage at the, in the House of Commons, the Security uh, Minister did undertake to consider the proposal of the opposition front bench to allow a senior officer in such circumstances to direct that the detainee use a solicitor from an approved panel, so in both the Noble Lord, Lord Marks and Lord Rosser uh, mentioned. Um, and, and he has reiterated, no Lord Lord Ross has re reiterated the same principle in today's debate. I think that such an approach may offer an acceptable way through this issue and I can undertake to give a sympathetic consideration to his amendment in advance of report stage. But I can't be as accommodating about Amendment 84 because it would remove the power under Schedule 3 to delay a consultation between the detainee and their solicitor where a senior officer has reasonable grounds to believe that the exercise of this right will result in the consequences uh, that I've previously described. Powers for an officer to delay the communication of the fact of a person's detention to a named person and to delay that detainee's access to a solicitor have been enshrined in PACE for many years. These powers are therefore not new or novel, but are familiar in the wider policing context and uh, allow the police to delay contact with a third party or consultation with a solicitor where there are reasonably founded concerns that knowledge of the person's detention may result in serious consequences. To remove this power of delay would undermine the ability to mitigate these risks. I have already addressed part of Amendment 63, but if I could now respond to the proposed changes to the other powers that allow an examining officer to restrict a Schedule 7 uh, detainee's access to a solicitor. 
These restrictions under Schedule 8 of the 2000 Act currently allow an examining officer to question a de detainee without consultation having first taken place with a solicitor in person, but I must point out this does not preclude the detainee from con consulting a solicitor via another means, for example, by telephone. <coughs> The powers can only be exercised where the officer reasonably believes that to wait for the solicitor to arrive in person would prejudice the, de the determination of the relevant matters. Amendment 63, however, would limit the availability of these restrictions to a situation where waiting for the solicitor to arrive in person could create an immediate risk of physical injury to a person. My Lords, this is contrary to the intention of the powers which were designed to mitigate the risk of a detainee using their right to consult a solicitor to obstruct and frustrate the examination and, of course, run down the short detention clock. As Noble Lords will be aware, as Noble Lord Lord Anderson pointed out, uh, the maximum period of examination is limited to six hours. It would not take a trained uh, terrorist or a hostile actor to work out that if, if they were in, insisting on speaking to a solicitor in person who happens to be located many miles away from the port where they're being examined, they have a means of significantly de delaying their examination. The current powers under Schedule 8 provide a practical solution to mitigate that risk by allowing the person to consult with the solicitor over, a phone, over the phone. If the person refuses that alternative or the solicitor is unavailable, then the officer can continue questioning the person while they wait for the solicitor to arrive. Any decision by the officer to apply these restrictions must be clearly recorded. My Lords, before using these restrictions, the, examiner, the examining officer will exhaust all other means to ensure that the detainee has been able to consult a solicitor in private, including directing them to a solicitor of the duty solicitor scheme. The proposed changes Amendment 63 would resurrect the risks that I have described and undermine key powers for countering ter terrorism. Um, the Noble Lord, uh, Lord Anderson, has asked um, when, about recording when restrictions are actually used in um, uh, the UK, as in as in, Nor in Great Britain, as in Northern Ireland, uh, we will consider with our operational partners uh, which statistics would be appropriate to publish with regard to Schedule Three. Um, and I hope that he is, is satisfied, and I'll keep him updated on that. Um, if I could find. Okay. I'm grateful to the, the noble baroness. She, she asks wh whether I'm satisfied. As independent reviewer, I was told four years ago that this was happening, and that wasn't the first time I've been told it was happening I in relation to Schedule 8. And I'm sure she, the noble minister didn't mean to, to backtrack on that commitment, um, but uh, I certainly would be very grateful if she felt able to uh, give somebody a bit of a push. Well, I was going to say shove, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll give them a push instead. Um, I think that's, that's probably more, more in keeping with your Lordship's house. Um, but, my Lords, uh, if I could just move finally to Amendments 83 and, 30, uh, and 87, if I may draw the Committee's attention to the Draft Schedule 3 Code of Practice, which I have actually already circle, uh, circulated to Noble Lords. Um, the draft code, like its equivalent for Schedule 7, is clear that a person who has been detained under either power must be provided with a notice of detention that clarifies their rights and obligations. The, examine, the examining officer uh, must also explain these rights and obligations to the date detainee before continuing with the examination. In addition, at each periodic review of the detention, the examining officer must remind the detainee of any rights that they have not yet, yet exercised. Um, but uh, the Government is in complete agreement that any person who is detained under Schedule 3 should be informed of their rights for any further questioning takes place. It's always been the, the case through the exercise of Schedule 7 powers, and it's why we've made it explicit in the draft equivalent code of practice for Schedule 3. So while the Government is clear that the intention behind these amendments has already been satisfied through the provision of the draft code, I am ready now to consider uh, further the merits of writing in such a requirement onto the face of Schedule 3 and Schedule 8 of the Terrorism Acts. Um, so I hope um, 
with those remarks, noble lords would be um, content. Uh, noble lord, Lord Marks, would be content to withdraw his amendment. Uh, my lords, I'm very grateful to uh, the noble lady, the minister, for the um, points she has said that she will consider, uh, and uh, we wait to hear uh, the results of that consideration. I'm very grateful also to all noble lords who have um, spoken in this debate. And although um, I don't necessarily come from the same position as the Noble Lord, Lord Anderson, uh, on these amendments. He did, of course, make a very important point about the um, recording of incidents when uh, the right of consultation with the solicitor is either delayed or restricted. And whether it is a push or a shove that is needed, it would be very helpful if um, uh, that could be uh, clearly achieved. Um, I do also make the point that while it is, of course, helpful uh, that in the vast majority of cases uh, the government uh, intends to ensure that the right to, cons to consult a solicitor uh, in private uh, is preserved in an undelayed or a timely uh, and confidential manner. But uh, I think the government should not underestimate the importance of the confidentiality uh, of advice. Uh, a point eloquently made by the noble uh, Lord, Lord Panic. And it is, of course, particularly relevant uh, in circumstances where answering questions uh, under these powers is compulsory. Uh, I do therefore invite the Government to consider very carefully, further, over and above the matters that the noble lady has said she will consider, uh, how far more proportionate ways of ensuring that detainees do not disrupt the purposes of their examination can be achieved without compromising confidentiality or the fundamental right to consult a solicitor. Uh, and if we uh, have that assurance, then I, I note that the noble lady, the minister, uh, is nodding in respect of that. Uh, I would be uh, happy, uh, meanwhile, to uh, withdraw my amendment, uh, but it's a matter we may well return to on report. Is it your lordship's pleasure that the amendment be withdrawn? The amendment is by leave withdrawn. In Schedule 3, Amendment 63A, Lord Rosser. Uh, the bill, as already been said, uh, provides for a person to be questioned and uh, detained under Schedule 3 powers uh, and makes it an offence to refuse to answer questions in uh, examinations. The draft code of uh, guidance um, which we've now seen, uh, recognises that there may be a preliminary stage of questioning in which people may be screened before an officer chooses to officially question them under the, uh, under the schedule. And uh, during screening, a person is not required to answer a question they don't want to, and the Code of Practice states that a person must be told when screening ends and an official examination begins. And the purpose of this amendment is simply to put the screening process, the right of a person not to answer questions, and equally importantly, the right of a person to be told when screening ends and questioning begins, to put it onto the uh, face of the bill. Um, the screening does not appear to uh, be an insignificant um, process. Um, the draft code of practice, in which we sought to enshrine in the amendment, um, sets out the kind of questions that can be asked and issues that can be raised uh, during the screening process. And uh, whilst it says there is no requirement for officers to make a record of a screening interaction, that is, unless the person is subsequently selected for a Schedule 3 uh, examination. So that there will be circumstances uh, in which there will be a requirement to make a record of a screening uh, interaction. And indeed, it also says um, that while screening of persons should take only a few minutes, I don't know what a few minutes is in this context, it says if it appears this period will take significantly longer, the examining officer must conclude the screening process and either commence a Schedule 3 examination or notify the person that they have no further questions. So once again, in that situation where they run out of time, and they decide to commence a Schedule 3 examination, then once again a record of the screening uh, interaction uh, must, be, uh, must be made. Um, it's not 
clear to us at the moment as to uh, why no reference to this process has appeared on the face of the bill. Uh, and uh, one purpose of the amendment is to seek to get an answer to that question, since it does appear to be a part of the process under Schedule 3, uh, which we have been, uh, been discussing. I move. Amendment proposed, page 38, line 35. At end, insert the words as printed on the marshalled list. I thank the member. Uh, I'm so yes, I think I might be very wise. I, I do apologise uh, uh, to your Lordship. Um, my Lords, for, for every person who is subject to a Schedule 7 examination, as I often used to report, there are 10 or 20 others who are asked light-touch um, screening questions on a consensual basis, um, as a result of which it is determined that a Schedule 7 examination is not necessary. The prevalence of screening questions may explain the discrepancy between the low and rapidly declining incidence of Schedule 7 examinations on the one hand, I think they're running at about a quarter of the level they were when the noble Lord Lord Carlyle handed over the post of independent reviewer to me, uh, and on the other hand, the perception of some people that they are stopped on a routine basis um, when they travel abroad. I reported in 2016 the example of a security-cleared government lawyer with a Muslim-sounding name who had been stopped by police on each of the last five occasions uh, that he'd left the country and on the majority of the occasions that he'd re-entered it, on each occasion, uh, as he acknowledged, for screening questions only. Uh, because screening questions are not recorded, there was, of course, no way of alerting uh, uh, people, ports officers, of the previous um, fruitless stops. Uh, I agree with the noble Lord Lord Rosser that the parameters applicable to screening questions need to be clearly set out uh, under Schedule 3 of the Bill as under Schedule 7. The draft code of practice, which I thank the Minister for providing well in advance, uh, goes a long way towards doing this, though I'm not sure it cracks all the old chestnuts, one of them being how, if at all, one could administer screening questions to a coachload of people uh, on their way to a possibly troubled part of the world. As to whether screening questions should go into statute, uh, the uh, noble lord is not alone in his view, uh, at least his provisional view. Senior ports officers have also said to me, uh, as I've recorded in the past, that if screening questions appeared in Schedule 7, we would all know where we stand. Uh, against that, one thinks of the provisions in PACE Code C relating to voluntary interviews, which are not enshrined in the Police and Criminal Evidence Act uh, 1984 itself, uh, no doubt because of the moral and social duty, as it has been described by the courts, uh, that every citizen has to give voluntary assistance to the police. So I approach this issue uh, with an open mind and look forward to hearing uh, what the Minister has to say. In particular, uh, could she tell us whether she's consulted the Investigatory Powers Commissioner on this issue, who is to have oversight of Schedule 3, uh, and if so, what did he have to say, because I suspect his view may well help to inform mine. Um, my Lords, uh, my noble friend Lord Anderson tempts me to say a few words on this matter. He's absolutely right that the number of uh, Schedule 7 stops declined dramatically over the years, and there was a very good reason for it. When I became independent reviewer of terrorism legislation, the phrase that was commonly used to me was copper's nose, and I was extremely concerned that cop because coppers actually, if the noble Lord, Lord Paddock will forgive me, don't always have the same size noses, nor the same air throughput into those noses. Some officers started to develop for themselves, indeed some, um, Lord Hogan Howe was here earlier, um, he's not here now, but um, some officers in, in, in Scotland Yard, in, on, in what is now called SO16, demonstrated to me the way in which they had refined Copper's Nose into a series of behavioural an analyses that led them to decide how to ask screening questions and if they were to ask screening questions. And indeed, a whole behavioural science has built up around this. It's called behavioural analysis and it emanated from America, but it's been well used, and I've been to a number of lectures about it involving police officers here. The formalization of screen screening questions, as um, suggested in the amendment we're considering, is, I regret, completely impractical. 
And my noble friend Lord Anderson referred to a coach load of passengers. One of the places I used to visit quite regularly was Dover Port, where buses come through at speed and officers go on to those buses and they ask questions like, where are you going? Or um, uh, when did you come to this country? Usually based on a reason that they have derived from the methodology they use towards the people they are questioning. And formalizing this process would make it very slow and actually would be more oppressive in the minds of those who are asked simple screening questions because they don't mind being asked a simple question or two, but they actually would mind very much if they were told in a way that suggested that it was part of a, of a formal police process. So my view is that the police generally do this very well. They should be left to do it in the way in which they do it. And we should not over formalize something which has evolved into a situation in which the people who are generally stopped and asked a series of questions and detained for a time, whose attention is demanded for a time, are usually people there are good reasons to ask more detailed questions of. Well, so I, I, I accept what the, the, the noble lord um, has, has just said, but my reading of this amendment is, is actually, because it says may include but is not limited to, would not limit the sort of questions that could be asked, um, but it does try to differentiate in a, in a formal way uh, between a situation where someone is being, where it's being decided whether a Schedule 7 situation should be uh, implemented, uh, as opposed to simply asking uh, simple questions uh, uh, as indicated in this amendment. Stan, if he looks at this amendment, does he really think that an examining officer getting onto a bus at Dover should walk up to a passenger and say, um, I am notifying you that an examination under Schedule 7 of the Terrorism Act has been commenced. Um, you're not obliged to answer any questions or engage with me in, during this screening process. Um, it's not an offence to, uh, to refuse to engage with me in any way during this screening process. Um, where are you going? It sounds an absurdity to me, and we'd be obstructive to the normal work of police officers under Schedule 7. And doesn't he agree, too, that although the number of Schedule 7 stops has been reduced dramatically, there remains effectiveness in Schedule 7, which, for example, was never shown in Section 44, Stop and Search, which he will remember well. I'm very grateful to, to, to the noble lord. The, the, my reading of this is, is to try and differentiate between a Schedule 7 encounter where the person is not entitled to silence, who has to answer questions because they commit an offence if they don't, and the informal process that leads up to a Schedule 7 uh, encounter. Thank the noble lord, um, the noble lords, for their their, their points um, on this amendment. Um, and just to um, start off, um, the IPC has just to answer the noble lord, Lord Anderson's uh, point. The IPC has been consulted throughout the drafting um, of uh, the code. But I think um, perhaps the interactions between noble lords um, actually probably would go to the root of of of, of the no, of the noble lord lord um ross's uh, amendment um the section on screening outlined in the schedule three code which mirrors the existing guidance through the equivalent ct powers is there to provide ports officers with clarity on the distinction between questions that can be asked by police officers in the ordinary course of their duties with a view to deciding whether to examine someone and questions that are only permissible once a schedule three examination has commenced that is those questions des designed to elicit information to enable the officer to determine whether the person is or has been uh, concerned in hostile activity. 
Now, my lords, we've all come across police officers as we go about our daily lives and are very used to seeing them on local streets, in tourist hotspots or protecting our national infrastructure. Where there are officers on the ground, where, wherever that, that might be, it's reasonable to expect that those officers will interact with the public. It's not only reasonable, my lords, but a vital aspect of frontline policing. And these interactions will vary, they'll depend on specific purposes, they may uh, range from polite conversation between an officer and a member of the public to a situation where an officer wants to query where, why a person is acting in a certain way or why they're present in a certain place. In such circumstances, police officers don't rely on specific powers of questioning, rather they're simply engaging members of the public during the ordinary course of their duty, as the noble Lord, uh, Lord Carlyle pointed out. And it's no different when officers are stationed at UK ports. It would be very unusual if officers did not interact with the public in this way. It would be even more unusual if frontline officers were not able to use these interactions to determine whether any further action was needed. But it's unfortunate in trying to clarify the distinction between what would constitute questioning or interaction during the ordinary course of police duties and questioning that can only take place once a Schedule 3 examination has commenced, that the language and intention of the code has somehow been misunderstood. If I could be clear, what's referred to as screening in the draft code is not a prescribed process or procedure that ports officers must adopt before selecting a person for examination. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a clarification of what questions can be asked, if appropriate, prior to selection for examination, as against the questions that can only be asked during an examination. So it's quite possible that a ports officer will speak to members of the public at a UK port in the course of their duties with no intention of selecting them for an examination of any kind. Of course, the person's behaviour might lead the officer to consider use of a police power, but Amendment 63A could have the unfortunate implication that in other contexts, absent uh, specific stat uh, 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 statutory powers, officers are unable to talk to the public or to request to see their documents in the ordinary course of their duties to determine whether they need to take further step of invoking their legal powers. So it defines such questioning as being part of the Schedule 3 examination itself rather than something that takes place before an examination. All that said, my Lords, um, even though I don't agree with the amendment, we will actually consider whether further clarity is needed in the code before formally laid uh, before Parliament for a debate and approval by both Houses. And I hope with that assurance the Noble Lord would be content to withdraw his amendment. Thank the Noble Lady, the Minister, for that response and also to uh, all other Noble Lords who have participated in this um, uh, brief debate. Um, I am grateful to the Noble Lady, the Minister, for saying that uh, I think I've understood her correctly that there will be further reflection on this issue, but I accept that the noble lady has not turned around and, on behalf of the government, accepted the amendment. I don't know whether it's the listing of the potential questions that was the cause of the difficulty, and uh, if it is, perhaps one way it might be simply to make reference that there may be a screening process without actually laying down specifically what the questions are that may or may not be asked as part of it, since most of the debate that's taken place seems to have centred on listing the specific questions, which of course have been lifted um, straight from what is in the code uh, of practice. I think, actually, it, it, the, the Noble Lord Lord Carlyle put it correctly that um, I think rather than prescribe a list of questions, I think just to seek clarity within the code is, is w what I'm seeking to do um, in due course. Well, I, I take it from that the noble lady, the minister, will be coming back uh, to us to uh, let us know the outcome of that. Um, well, on that basis, because uh, I thank the noble lady, the minister, for her response, and I beg leave to withdraw the amendment. Your Lordship's pleasure that the amendment be withdrawn. It is by leave withdrawn. Amendment 64 and 65, Baroness Hamwe, not moved. 65A, Lord Rosser, not moved. 65A, not moved. Amendment 66, Lord Anderson. 
My Lords, this amendment goes to the purposes for which the Schedule 3 power can be uh, used. Uh, it raises what I believe is an important point of principle uh, to which there may, however, uh, be a pragmatic solution. Schedule 3, like Schedule 7, contains perhaps the most extensive police powers anywhere in the statute book, extending to uh, uh, questioning with no right to silence, to detention, taking of fingerprints and DNA samples, and the downloading of mobile devices and the long-term retention of their content, all without the need for any objective or even subjective suspicion of wrongdoing. Those powers are already used under Schedule 7 by police of all ranks at very short notice in seaports and airports, both large and small, and anywhere within a mile of the Northern Irish border. Their extraordinary strength makes it all the more important that the purpose for which the powers can be used uh, is clearly defined and understood. Schedule 7 is limited to the purpose of determining whether someone is a terrorist. Having learned from intelligence reports that it was in practice being extensively used also for the purposes of determining whether people were involved in proliferation or espionage, I suggested some years ago as independent reviewer that the reach of the power could usefully be extended uh, to these other purposes. This would have uh, put practice in accordance with the law and it would have avoided the absurdity of having to pretend that David Miranda stopped under Schedule 7 when carrying documents stolen by Edward Snowden through Heathrow Airport uh, might have been a terrorist uh, when more obvious explanations falling outside the scope of Schedule 7 suggested themselves. After the Salisbury incident, this suggestion found favour with the government. Schedule 3 powers, it is proposed, may be used for uh, counter-proliferation and counter-espionage, and also to determine whether persons crossing the border are involved in other forms of hostile activity, such as assassination, uh, whether or not with biological weapons. For myself, I entirely support that objective. Where I part company with the Bill is in the suggestion that these very extensive powers, memorably described uh, by the noble Lord Lord Carlyle, in his regular talks to the police as a Ming vase, uh, precious and to be treated with very great care, should be used in order to determine whether a traveller has been engaged in activity which is perfectly lawful. That is a consequence of paragraphs 16a and 16b of Schedule 3. National security, as is well known, is nowhere defined in legislation, nor even, I was, uh, 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 nor even in, in the draft code of practice. The concept of threats to the economic well-being of the United Kingdom is more nebulous still, and as the noble Lord Lord Paddock said, it's not even linked in Schedule 3, as it is in other contexts, uh, to the concept of national security, let alone to a concept as specific as the critical national infrastructure uh, to which the Minister referred earlier. Uh, and acts falling into these categories need not be crimes. Indeed, they, not, they need not even be carried out for, on behalf, for or on behalf of a foreign state. It's enough that they are judged by the officer on duty to be in the interests of such a state. My Lords, it is quite true uh, that MI5 is tasked by Section 1 of the Security Service Act 1989 with the functions of protecting national security and safeguarding the economic well-being of the United Kingdom from foreign threats. No one would quarrel with that. My unease stems from the proposal that the police be given new and very strong coercive powers, powers that intrude into civil liberties and that are not allowed to our intelligence agencies for the purpose of determining whether persons may have acted in ways that are not contrary to the law. Uh, my Lords, I'm concerned by that. The police are entrusted with executive powers for the purpose of detecting crime and enforcing the criminal law. We have a wide range of offences relating to CBRN materials, espionage, sabotage and other types of hostile state activity. If that range is insufficient, or if the sentences are too short, as the noble lady, the minister, uh, indicated uh, uh, she thought might have been the case with some of the lesser offences under the Official Secrets Act uh, 1989, well, it's open to the government uh, to seek change change the law on official secrets or 
change its own definition of serious crime for the purposes of, of this bill, uh, as uh, the government uh, apparently had no difficulty in doing uh, in the data acquisition reg regulations. Uh, and I see the noble Lord, Lord Paddock nodding ruefully, um, but uh, those regulations were co considered only very recently uh, by the House. I think in that case the, the definition was reduced to, to, to 12 months. So if the issue is the sentences of only two years for lesser offences under the Official Secrets Act 1989, um, that is worth uh, thinking about. But this bill, as it stands, would allow these strong coercive powers to be used by any police officer for the purposes of defining whether people have acted in undefined ways that the government may not like but has not chosen to make unlawful. I'm not sure I can think of any precedent for this, uh, and I should be grateful if the Minister uh, could tell me uh, if she knows of any. In its Human Rights Memorandum, the government relies heavily in relation to Schedule 3 on the majority decision of the Supreme Court in Begal on Schedule 7. But in Schedule 7, the scope of non-consensual police powers is strictly defined and limited to uh, the detection of serious criminal activity. Uh, that is certainly uh, not uh, the case uh, here. Uh, the noble Baroness, uh, Baroness Manning and Buller, who I know cannot be uh, in her place uh, at the moment, uh, thought uh, that the current version of the schedule could perhaps be swallowed as a temporary patch, uh, pending perhaps the amendment of the Official Secrets Act or a change to the definition of serious crime. Lords, I'm not uh, very reassured uh, by that. Uh, temporary patches sometimes have a way of turning into uh, slippery slopes. Uh, I shall listen carefully to the Minister, but I wanted to signal by this amendment uh, that I am troubled. Amendment proposed, amendment proposed, page 38, line 41, leave out hostile act and insert serious crime. I support this amendment. I have supported every one of Lord Anderson's amendments uh, in this bill. Every time Lord Anderson has spoken during the course of our debates and said things that are agreeable to the government, he's wise, elegant, I can't think of all the many complimentary adjectives that have right been paid to him. Now, when he raises a point with which the government agrees, can the government please reflect that he is wise, elegant, <laughs> and so on and so forth, so that his uh, submissions, as they are to the government, uh, are taken with the seriousness they merit. I entirely support his expressions of anxiety about the breadth of this particular provision, and I think, if I may say so, we could make life much easier for everybody, not least the examining officer, but everybody who has to administer it, if we just reflected on a slight way of amending this. Now, I initially put my name down to Lord Anderson's amendment. I support it, but I've listened to the debate this afternoon and I see there are problems with it, in particular the problem raised by... Uh, Baroness Manning and Buller, who, as has just been said, is not now in her place. But we really could turn 6 and 7 into a much simpler piece of legislation. An act is a hostile act if it is an act of serious crime, and then at 7D define serious crime. I know it's defined differently in different parts of terrorism legislation, but this is a new power in effect producing a new scheme uh, and a, a new way of administering it if on conviction the offender would be liable to a term of imprisonment of two years. That I think would cover all the various matters raised by Baroness Manning and Buller in her um, part in the debate earlier and it might make life much easier for everybody. I share the concern about the breadth of the definition of hostile act as covering acts which threaten national security or threaten the economic well-being of the United Kingdom. These concepts are vague to the point of absurdity. I mean, some people, no doubt, would say that the Prime Minister's Brexit deal threatens the economic well-being of the United Kingdom. I wouldn't share that view, but uh, some people may, may say that. And because of the vagueness of these 
uh, concepts, they would inevitably confer extensive discretionary powers, which are inimical to the, uh, the rule of law. And because they are so vague, they will inevitably also inhibit perfectly lawful activities. My Lord, I, I uh, don't want to add to the comments that I made uh, in the debate around whether uh, Clause 21 should stand part or Schedule 3 should stand part of the Bill, um, which echoed the, the comments of uh, other uh, noble lords. Uh, as the, the noble uh, Lord, uh, Lord Anderson of Whip Ipswich uh, has said, um, regulations that we recently considered that are made under uh, the Investigatory Powers Act radically redefined serious crime um, to uh, offences which uh, carry a, a, a maximum sentence of 12 months imprisonment, but also all uh, offences involving communication or the invasion of privacy. So the government is, is, is uh, quite um, capable and in fact um, has uh, redefined serious crime to fit uh, uh, more precisely the powers uh, that uh, are referred to in different pieces of legislation, even different pieces of legislation um, or, or in regulations made under uh, a piece of legislation where the definition of serious crime is different. So I don't agree with the noble baroness um, uh, Manningham Buller who mentioned earlier that it wouldn't capture um, Official Secrets Act offences um, because the government, as has been suggested, can, has uh, and could um, change uh, the definition of serious crime in relation to uh, Schedule 3 powers. Just to be uh, very brief indeed, um, obviously we will um, listen with um, interest to what the government have to say uh, in uh, response to the uh, amendment that's been moved by the noble Lord, Lord Anderson of Ipswich. Um, but uh, I, I must say, um, and I say this obviously subject to what the government are going to say in response, it does seem to us to have considerable merit. My Lords, uh, before I start, could I just um, echo the words of the noble Lord, Lord Judge, that the noble Lord, Lord Anderson, is indeed wise and elegant in his words. Um, and um, the, uh, as he's explained, the group of amendments deals with the definition of hostile act in Schedule 3. My Lords, it's important to emphasise that the design of any new power should be specific to the threat it is seeking to mitigate. <clears throat> the scope of this power has been decide, designed to do just that, namely mitigate the known threats from hostile state activity. The danger, therefore, of these amendments is that they limit the scope of the power, thereby limiting the range of threats that it has been designed to combat. For the benefit of the committee, the port's powers under Schedule 3 to this bill will be used by examining officers at UK ports or the border area for the purposes of determining whether a person appears to be a person who is or has been in, engaged in hostile activity. A person is engaged in hostile activity if concerned in the commission, preparation or instigation of a hostile act that is or may be carried out on behalf of a state other than the UK or otherwise in the interests of a state other than the UK. A hostile act under this schedule is defined as an act that threatens national security, threatens the economic well-being of the UK or is an act of serious crime. My Lords, by replacing the term hostile act with serious crime, the effect of these amendments would be to significantly narrow the range of hostile activity that these powers are designed to counter. It would undoubtedly limit the ability of our ports and officers to detect, disrupt and deter hostile actors. Serious crime is defined in the Bill as being an offence which could reasonably be expected to result in imprisonment for a term of three years or more, or if the conduct involves the use of violence, results in substantial fi financial gain, or is conduct by a large number of persons in pursuit of a common pur purpose. My Lords, some of the activities which I believe noble lords would expect to be catch, captured through these new powers would not fall within the scope of the truncated definition of hostile activity. 
As Noble Lady, Lady Manuel Buller explained er, uh, earlier, some offences under the Official Secrets Act of 1989 only attract a maximum pe penalty of two years' imprisonment and may not involve the use of violence, result in financial gain or involve a large number of people acting in pursuit of a common purpose. Consequently, an examining officer would not be able to ex exercise Schedule 3 for the purposes of detecting, disrupting or deterring this type of hostile activity, even if the activity threatens national security or could be prosecuted under offences such as the Official Secrets Act. It's simply not acceptable. There may even be occasions where we have intelligence to suggest that a person linked to hostile state activity is travelling to the UK for a hostile purpose. However, the intelligence we have is incomplete and so the nature of the hostile purpose cannot be determined. Therefore, we cannot access whether, uh, sorry, assess whether the purpose is linked to a serious crime. In this circumstance, it would be very important to have a power to stop and examine them at the port to establish the nature of the hostile act. As noble lords will know, following the appalling acts in Salisbury, the government is undertaking a review of legislation to combat hostile state activity. Hostile activity by its very nature is often covert and undertaken by foreign intelligence officers or their agents seeking to acquire sensitive information to to gain an advantage over the United Kingdom and undermine our national security. On occasions, this activity may not be considered criminal under the law as it stands. For example, if a foreign intelligence officer intended to travel to the UK to maintain or build relationship, uh, a relationship with employees, contracted to work on UK defence projects with the aim of acquiring sensitive information, it may not be a crime. But it would be an imperative. It would be absolutely imperative to detect and disrupt this activity at its earliest opportunity. <coughs> excuse me, before irreversible damage to our national security occurs. My lords, it's entirely plausible that a hostile actor, <coughs> excuse me, should want to visit the UK in order to collect classified documents from an agent who had committed acts of espionage on their behalf. It is not a crime for the hostile actor to receive these documents and leave the country, and although the individual has not committed a crime, a Schedule 3 examination would enable an examining officer to make a determination as to whether they have been engaged in a hostile act. An examination would also allow the examining officer to remove the classified documents from the hostile actor, preventing the disclosure of potentially damaging information. Even though the purpose of a Schedule 3 examination is to make determination as to whether they have been engaged in a hostile act, exercise of the power may provide a number of secondary benefits. In the instances like the example I've just talked about, it would provide the first leads, the first leads into an investigation to detect who the agent is, if we didn't already know, and would prevent the documents from ever being disclosed. These investigations may or may not lead to future prosecutions. It is therefore right to give the police the power to investigate hostile state activity, even at a preliminary stage before we have reasonable suspicion that a foreign intelligence officer has committed offence. I know that noble lords don't really think that the police should not have the power to stop someone who is from or is acting on behalf of a foreign intelligence service as they enter or leave the United Kingdoms. The, the United Kingdom. If, and if we were to accept these amendments, traditional behaviours undertaken by hostile states, which have the potential to have such a detrimental effect, would fall out of scope of the power and we would not be able to detect, disrupt or deter it. And I put it to noble lords that such activity shouldn't go unchallenged. The definition of hostile act is necessarily broad to ensure that the powers capture the full range of activities that hostile actors engage in. We do recognise the concerns that have been raised and I'd like to reassure noble lords that these were considered in the drafting of Schedule 3. This is why we've, we've explicitly restricted the definition of hostile act to an act that is carried out for or on behalf of or otherwise in the interests of a state other than the United Kingdom. I do also recognise the concerns about the term economic well-being of the United Kingdom and um, 
My Lord, uh, there may be incident, in, instances where an act undertaken by a hostile state actor threatens the economic well-being of the UK, yet does not threaten our national security. That's been pointed out. It's also true for acts of serious crime. Economic well-being, like national security, is a term already used in UK legislation. The intention of this limb of the definition is to ensure that these powers can be used to mitigate against hostile acts which could damage uh, the country's critical infrastructure or disrupt energy supplies to the UK. For example, if an employee in the banking sector on the City of London discovered a serious vulnerability in their computer net networks and shared this information with a hostile state, this would drastically undermine confidence in the City of London and cost the UK economy millions, if not billions. My Lord, I hope with these explanations that Noble Lord feel uh, content to withdraw the amendment. My Lords, I'm great, grateful to the Minister and to all noble Lords who contributed to this debate, including the noble Baroness, uh, Baroness Manning and Buller, uh, who made her remarks earlier. I asked the Minister whether she could give another example of police being given strong coercive powers uh, for the purpose of determining whether people are acting in a way which may be undesirable, but which is perfectly lawful under the law of the land. I don't think I had an answer, and if there is no answer, I would suggest that the bill, uh, as written, constitutes a new and very dangerous uh, departure. That is the point of principle uh, behind this uh, amendment, and with great respect to the Minister, she didn't address that point of principle uh, in her reply. I do hope the Minister will consider this carefully, uh, because any, uh, my concerns, as she has heard, are shared uh, by lawyers far more distinguished than I, and not only by lawyers. As to the pragmatic solution, uh, the Minister has heard suggestions on how the scope of this power could be reduced in a way that achieves its objectives in a manner more consistent with the principle of legality. I hope uh, she will deliberate further on those suggestions. I'd be more than happy to discuss them with her, uh, but in the meantime, I withdraw the amendment. Your Lordship, it's a pleasure that the amendment be withdrawn. The amendment is by leave withdrawn. Amendment 67, Lord Anderson, not moved. Uh, amendment 67, ZA, Lord Rassler. Yes, it's already been said on uh, more than one occasion. Schedule 3 deals with uh, border security and the power to stop, question and detain, and states that an examining officer may question a person for the purpose of determining whether the person appears to be a person who is or has been engaged in hostile activity. And Schedule 3 then goes on to say that an examining officer may exercise the powers, whether or not there are grounds for suspecting that a person is or has been engaged in hostile activity, and there does not need to be uh, reasonable suspicion. And that is, of course, a very considerable power and safeguards need to be there to ensure the power is used in a necessary and proportionate manner. And the amendment which I'm moving seeks to provide such a safeguard in relation uh, to this power by providing that the investigatory powers commissioner must be informed when a person is stopped and also make an annual report on the use of this power. Now, in the schedule, there is provision for the uh, investigatory powers commissioner to keep under review the operation of the many provisions in the schedule and make an annual report to the Secretary of State about the outcome of the review. Uh, in the Commons, the Government were asked if in carrying out the review process and producing the report, which I think is under Part 6 of Schedule 3, uh, to which I have referred, uh, the Commissioner would be aware of every stop that had taken place, because this amendment provides that the Commissioner must be informed of such stops. And the initial reply from the Commons Minister was yes. Uh, but he then went on to say, although the Commissioner will not be informed every time someone is stopped, the numbers will all be recorded and he will have the power to investigate those stops while doing the review. Um, that appears uh, a qualification of the initial answer of yes. The information the Commissioner will get is uh, numbers, perhaps total numbers, and that may apparently be some time after individuals have been stopped. 
And I say this amendment provides that the Commissioner must be informed when a person is stopped. So will the investigatory powers Commissioner be informed when people are stopped, questioned and detained, or only given numbers at a frequency that is unstated? And will the Commissioner be told why people have been stopped, questioned and detained, or is that something he or she will have to inquire about when given overall numbers at some later stage. Now, as I understand it, the government's argument uh, in, in relation to this of power um, appears to have been that the Terrorism Act uh, 2000 powers on counter-terrorism have been used to stop, question and detain people where there is an issue of potential hostile activity and that the bill simply regularises what is already happening. Uh, if I have understood the government's argument, does that mean then that the government expect no increase in the number of people being stopped, questioned and detained at our borders, and particularly at the sensitive border in Ireland between North and South? Um, because that is one interpretation one could put on it if it is correct that the government are saying this bill simply regularises something that's already being happening under the powers in the Terrorism Act 2000. Um, if that is not the case though, and the government does expect an increase in the numbers of people being stopped as a result of this provision, on what scale is that increase expected to be? I move. Amendment occurs. Page 39, line 7. At end, insert the words as printed on the marshalled list. Not clear whether the noble lord was um, using this um, uh, amendment particular to, to um, seek for more information, but I have to say our, our uh, response to it was to wonder about the operational practicality of the first paragraph. Um, which also suggests that um, if the uh, commissioner is informed of a stop, then the commissioner would have some power or some role to respond to particular stops. Um, but um, I think more importantly, the, the point that's, points that he, he makes or that were implicit in, in what he says about keeping records, keeping data, which um, the, the noble Lord, Lord Anderson, I think used the term meticulous um, in another context about keeping records in Northern Ireland and about the basis of those for review uh, of practice. I think those are, are, are very important. So though we'd um, have hesitation about the first of the paragraphs, I think that what um, has prompted this is important. <laughs> My Lords, <clears throat> as the Noble Lord, Lord Rosser, pointed out, Amendment 67 uh, ZA would require an examining officer to notify the IPC every time a person is examined under Schedule 3 and require the Commissioner to publish an annual report on the use of the powers in the Northern Ireland border area. In relation to the second uh, part of the amendment, uh, as the Noble Lord stated, Part 6 of Schedule 3 already requires the commission, Commissioner to review the use of the powers and to make an annual report. The police will make a record of every examination conducted under <coughs> Schedule 3, as they already do with Schedule 7. And if I could reassure, reassure Noble Lords that the Commissioner will be afforded full access to these records on request and information on how the powers have been exercised. It would, I think, uh, place an unnecessary burden on the examining officer to have to notify the Commissioner each and every time uh, a person has been examined. And regarding concerns on how the powers will be exercised at the border in Northern Ireland, uh, media and political commentary over the summer sought wrongly to conflate the introduction of this legislation with discussions on the Irish border in the context of Brexit and concerns over the possibility of more stringent measures. The Security wrote to the Shadow Secretary of State for Northern Ireland on the 4th of October to address these concerns and I circulated a copy of that letter after second reading, um, so I won't repeat um, 
the uh, his response in full here but what I do want to reiterate is that it's simply not the case that these powers will be used as an immigration control or to interfere with the right to travel within the CTA their application to the border area mirrors that of the analogous counter-terrorism powers in schedule 7 to the 2000 act that have been in operation for 18 years uh, and in that time my lords we have not seen a blanket or large-scale use of these powers in the border area in fact the number of examinations in Northern Ireland as a whole during 2017-18 amounted to 6% of the UK's uh, total the Schedule 3 powers must only be used to determine a, per a person's involvement in hostile activity. The location and extent of their use will be informed by the threat from hostile activity and any decision to use them will be on a case-by-case -case basis. While an annual report of, uh, of the Commissioner will not provide a location breakdown of where the powers are exercised, for clear national security reasons, he will review police exercise of the powers including their use in Northern Ireland. The Noble Lord, Lord uh, Rosser uh, asked, does the bill regularise stops um, that are already taking place under Schedule 7? And the answer to that is no. Schedule 3 powers will be used only to determine whether a person is engaged in hostile activity. And we've already discussed the definition of hostile activity, and that is broad scope, is to mitigate uh, a range of threats. Schedule 7 is about uh, persons engaging in terrorism. I hope that in the comments that I've made that I've been able to reassure uh, the Noble Lord, uh, Lord Rosser, and that he'd be content to withdraw his amendment. The noble Lady, the Minister, for that uh, uh, response, and also to uh, Noble Lady Baroness Hanwy for um, her contribution to this um, brief debate. Um, I think the point I was seeking to clarify in relation to um, Section 7 was that, um, as I understood it, the government had been uh, uh, arguing or maintaining that sometimes those um, powers under the Terrorism Act of 2000 were in fact being used to stop people who it might be argued were involved in hostile activity. And that's the point I was trying to confirm as to whether the government felt that what they were doing now was simply regularising something that was happening under another act or whether we are talking about a new group of people who may be stopped and detained who are not being stopped and detained at the present time. And I gather from what the noble lady is saying, we are talking about a new group of people who will be stopped and detained. We are not talking about people uh, who, rightly or wrongly, may have been stopped and detained under the Terrorism Act on the basis it was counter-terrorism. Yeah. Right. Well, can I come back to the, uh, um, the uh, issue uh, then? Um, but I assume the noble lady is once again going to say that she's unable to give a response. But uh, are we expecting a significant increase then in the numbers of people being stopped and detained? Because the noble lady has said that these will be people who are, uh, who, who are not being stopped and detained at the present time under other powers when perhaps those powers shouldn't have been being used. These will be new people. Is that the, situ is that the situation? And uh, is it likely to be an extensive number? Because the noble lady has said, well, it will be very difficult for the Commissioner to be advised every time somebody was stopped, which suggests that there are significant numbers or, or will be significant numbers of people. If the Noble Lord would um, give way. Um, in terms of numbers, I mean, mercifully for the UK public, the number of uh, people involved in hostile state activity is low um, and in terms of the other question that he asked about the um, the commissioner the commissioner will have access to all um, uh, all the reports what the commissioner won't do um, oh I've just got an answer here we're expecting far fewer than under schedule seven um, but I, but I, I, I I think I express that, but in a different way, which is, is we don't expect um, a plethora of, 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 um, of, of, of new cases. But the information, uh, the, um, 
the IPC can have access to all uh, the records. What I'm saying is that he doesn't have to be informed every time. Um, <laughs> so he will have all the information that he needs. Uh, well, then, could I thank the noble lady, the minister, for that um, response? I'll certainly want to um, reflect on uh, what has been said, but in the meantime, I beg leave to withdraw the amendment. Your Lordship, pleasure that the amendment be withdrawn. It is by leave withdrawn. Amendment 67A, Lord Malford. My Lord, you putting down this amendment? I'm not concerned particularly with what the power should be for um, uh, stopping people, nor am I concerned with um, the, the powers uh, and the way they're used, or, and the various matters have been shortly ago discussed as to the retention of information and all that. All I'm concerned with is to make it more efficient than it appears to be under the bill as drafted, because I thought that in this section and under um, 3B, um, and, um, I, I feel that the, the, the words to give the examining officer on request either a valid passport which included a photograph or other document which establishes P's identity is an incredibly amateur way of doing it. It does seem to me that nowadays um, we do have much better methods of establishing people's identity and the DNA is probably one of the best and it's also now of course wholly unintrusive because you no longer have to take blood sample or anything like that you can simply take a swab and so all I'm suggesting is that the, this bill should give those uh, officers who feel it necessary to try to establish an identity or to record an identity the means of doing so in a much more certain way. So it is very limited. It's merely a tool which I'm suggesting should be included in this particular schedule. I beg to move. Amendment proposed, page 39, line 41, at end insert the words as printed. My Lords, I hope I can reassure my, my noble friend, at least in, in part. Um, my Lord, as, as my noble friend Lord Milesford has explained, Amendment 67A would allow an examining officer during the course of a Schedule 3 ports examination to require a person to provide a DNA sample. This would be in addition to the powers available to these officers to request information and identity documents. My Lords, the ability to establish a person's identity is in, undoubtedly an important aspect of an examination to determine whether that individual is or has been engaged in hostile activity. I would therefore highlight to my noble friend that these powers already allow for the taking of fingerprints and samples to help ascertain a person's identity. Paragraphs 27 and 35 currently allow for the taking of fingerprints and samples where a person has been detained. This biometric information can also be taken from the detainee without their consent, but only at a police station and if authorised by a superintendent who is satisfied that it is necessary in order to assist in determining whether the detainee is or has been engaged in hostile activity or to ascertain the detainee's identity. We're satisfied that these powers, which are subject to important safeguards, are fit for purpose and achieve the right outcome. In particular, we don't consider it necessary or proportionate to confer a power on examining officers to require examinees who have not been detained to provide a DNA sample. The provisions in Schedule 3 to the Bill governing the taking and retention of DNA and fingerprints mirror the long-standing provisions in Schedule 8 to the Terrorism Act 2000, which governs the taking of biometric information from those detained under Schedule 7 to that Act. The experience gained in operating the counter-terrorism ports powers do not suggest that a different approach is needed here, and indeed the police haven't asked for the power envisaged in my noble friend's 
uh, amendment. So given this, and on the basis that Schedule 3 already makes provision for the taking of fingerprints and DNA from persons detained under Schedule 3, I would ask my noble friend to withdraw his amendment. I would say an indifference really is that what I seek is that if it is thought necessary to investigate someone, not necessarily to detain them, and establish their identity, it is sensible to have the power to take a sample which will help to do that. That is my point. So once again, I'm not uh, contradicting what my noble friend says about the powers that already exist for taking of samples of persons who've been detained. I'm concerned that when it is regarded, for whatever reason, as desirable to establish somebody's identity, at the same time, there should be the power to take the biometric samples required, which I'm suggesting should be DNA because it is so much more certain and easier now than it ever used to be. And that's why I'd like to, uh, and I don't honestly quite see what my noble friend's argument is against it. Perhaps he could just comment a little bit further on that before I withdraw the amendment. Um, the, the argument is that the, the police and the authorities believe they had all, have all the powers they need already and that those powers do enable them to um, uh, detain a person if they, if they think it's uh, necessary and if that uh, decision is confirmed in the way that I described um, to assist in determining uh, whether the de detainee has been uh, engaged in hostile activity or, uh, as relevant to my noble friend's amendment, to ascertain the detainee's identity. So if a suspicion arises uh, uh, about the detainees, uh, about the individual's identity, uh, the detention process could offer a way through um, uh, to enable the uh, DNA sample to be taken. I never friend would realise what I'm proposing is the use of the, of the DNA capability in circumstances where it is not necessary at that stage at any rate to detain people. I mean, you know, I don't think in order to establish somebody's identity, uh, I, I'm almost going back to the points I made on Monday in the need for having um, uh, identity numbers with biometrics securely. I, I, I was never envisaging that the use of, of the establishment of identity should only be able to be done if somebody is detained. Being detained is a much more serious matter than merely asking somebody to give a, um, a method of establishing their identity. That is, I think, where the, I'm sure not my naval friend, but perhaps the Home Office, misunderstands what I'm uh, trying to say. Um, I don't know if my noble friend would like to just say any, one more thing. I'm, I'm grateful to, to my noble friend and possibly the, the answer is for me to, to write him after uh, this, this committee uh, session. But I think um, that, um, my, my feeling would be that um, f to require someone who is not detained to uh, supply a DNA sample um, would uh, cross a line of civil liberties that um, many would feel was uncomfortable and um, therefore it, it should, in, in my judgment, only be for those detained, and obviously you're only detained for a good reason, um, to be required to supply such a sample. I agree with the, the uh, noble earl, uh, the minister, uh, regarding the civil liberties issue. Of course, the other problem is that taking a DNA sample will only assist in identifying who that individual is if that person's DNA had already been taken and was on a database. I don't think we have many Russian spies uh, DNA that we would then be able to identify uh, that they are a hostile actor 
by taking a DNA sample from them. And indeed, um, that there are, it's only a small proportion of the UK population who have been arrested and convicted whose DNA would appear on a database. So the benefits, in, in addition to the infringement of civil liberties of completely innocent people having to provide DNA samples, uh, it would be of limited benefit because of the limited nature of uh, the existing DNA database against which that DNA sample could be compared. <laughs> I'd like to support uh, the noble Earl and uh, the noble Lord, Lord Paddock, because, um, well, first of all, it's quite rare to, to agree with the noble Earl, um, and so I thought I'd take this advantage to do so. But also, you would have widespread condemnation of this particular move. It would be deeply unpopular, and it would be hard enough getting ID cards through legislation without a lot of uh, resistance, and this idea would be even tougher. I've I listened to what people said, and what I think is the important point made was by my noble friend, Lord Howe, which is that, the, is that we still have a hang-up about DNA samples. I do not myself see, um, but I agree that uh, perception is what matters, and it may be I'm slightly ahead of uh, public perception. I do not myself see any difference in being asked to give a DNA sample for identification than, than almost any other method of doing so. If it involved taking blood or something, it would be another matter. But nowadays, a DNA can be taken by a simple swab. And of course, it's self-evident that if you haven't got a matching DNA, it doesn't take you very far. But there would be many circumstances in which having, having had the suspicion of somebody, uh, you then have a DNA, it might at some stage be useful. But I don't accept the the general point that it's, um, there's something sinister about um, DNA, which means we shouldn't use it. I think it should be used a great deal more than it is. But having said that, I withdraw the amendment. The question is that this uh, is it your Lordship's pleasure that this uh, amendment be withdrawn? Amendment is by leave withdrawn. Amendment 68, Baroness Jones and Morton. Uh, my Lords, I spoke earlier in committee about my opposition to the whole of Schedule 3 of this Bill, but I rise now to uh, speak to my amendments 68 and 69. Um, I have to declare an interest. I have a journalist daughter and obviously know many of her friends and they could be very adversely affected by um, this particular part of the Bill because it is about the protection of journalistic material. Because Schedule 3 of this bill allows border officials to question, search and detain anyone at the border without any suspicion whatsoever, that means that people carrying journalistic material or legally privileged material might want to refuse to hand over that material without committing a criminal offence. And so without Amendment 68, journalists and lawyers could be forced to hand over sensitive and confidential material at the border. Now this surely can't be the government's intention in drafting the bill and it surely won't be Parliament's will to allow such a scheme to become law. And without Amendment 69, journalistic material confiscated at the border, including information about their confidential sources, could be exposed in open court as evidence. This would be an enormous erosion of press freedom and the sacrosanct duty for journalists to protect their sources. It would have a chilling effect on individuals coming forward which, with information which is in the public interest. I have myself been approached by whistleblowers. I'm well aware of the severe consequences that await them and anything that deters people from coming forward with information about corrupt practices or wrongdoing really mustn't add to the burden. As currently drafted, Schedule 3 would put sources in danger of losing their jobs, liberty or even their lives. Now, the government would never allow their confidential intelligence sources to be exposed in this way, and I asked the Minister to explain why journalist sources should be treated any differently. I know that the Minister, earlier in this committee, uh, declined to put specific protections in law for journalists uh, on the basis that it was too broad a term. And this is why my amendments and Amendment 71 in Earl Ackley's name use the existing definitions in the Police and Criminal Evidence Act and the Investigatory Powers Bill. And I hope that this approach is more palatable to the Minister and an approach that could be 
adopted at report stage. I omitted to mention that um, the noble Earl Lord Attlee is not able to be here today and I said I would say a few words on his behalf and he said he was absolutely sure I could find the right words, so let's hope I have. Uh, my Lords, these amendments are essential to protect press freedoms and the confidentiality of their sources. I do hope that the Minister will listen to the concerns and bring forward amendments to fix the problems highlighted. I beg to move. Page 9941, at the end, insert the words as printed. We have uh, an amendment in this uh, group, which is uh, 69A, uh, and uh, the purpose of this amendment is to provide that where um, an examining officer wishes to retain an article, which the owner alleges contains confidential material, that the examining officer may not examine the article and must immediately um, provide the article or send the article to the Investigatory Powers Commissioner and the Commissioner must then determine whether the article contains confidential material and uh, may then authorise the examination and retention of the article uh, under the provisions of, um, of the Bill or return it to the examining officer if it's not confidential. And uh, this would provide for the independent oversight of confidential material as required by the Miranda judgment. Um, now, I appreciate that what the uh, government are proposing um, does not uh, in line with, obviously not in line with what our uh, amendment says. Um, and it, um, we do now have the uh, code of practice. And uh, the code of practice does say that if during the process of examining an article it becomes apparent to the examining officer that there are reasonable grounds for believing that the article consists of or in includes items that are confidential material, the examining officer must cease examining the item. And it also says, this is the code of practice, that an examining officer should take reasonable steps to review the credentials of an examinee to verify any such claim when considering whether there are reasonable grounds to believe that a specific item is confidential material. Um, what would be uh, uh, helpful if the noble lady, the minister, could uh, respond to these uh, one or two points I want to, to raise, since the purpose of the um, amendment, I'd have to say, is primarily to find out um, uh, how is it intended that the process will operate, though we would obviously be extremely grateful if the government decided they were going to accept the amendment. But if an examining officer does review the credentials of an examinee and feels that those credentials stand up, um, are they then still able to um, examine material which they think uh, may, con may be of a confidential nature? If the, if, the, um, uh, if the examinee has said that there is confidential material there and the examining officer is satisfied with their credentials, um, is that in fact enough to present the ex item being examined at all or would the officer still be accepted, expected or able to examine an item and ascertain for themselves that it contains what appears to be confidential material, i.e. is the idea of checking or reviewing the credentials of the examinee, if the officer, examining officer is satisfied with those, does that mean then that there is no question of the examining officer themselves looking at any material which the examinee maintains is confidential that they have then immediately got to send it uh, to the uh, investigate to the um, to the commissioner to decide whether or not it should be retained and i have to say we despite what i've just said we are not unappreciative of the government's argument that an officer may not always be able to accept a claim at face value that something contains confidential material. But does the government believe that the system which is now set out in the Bill in the Code of Practice, which still involves the examining officer having sight of an article before it's passed to the Commissioner, does the government believe that that fully realises the protections that the Miranda judgment uh, recommended? 
And I ask this, particularly as the government has now introduced an emergency procedure, so urgent cases will not be slowed down by any system of independent oversight. And uh, we surely need to make sure that we get these protections uh, right and that they do conform with the Miranda um, judgment. Uh, I mean, one can think, for example, of a scenario that um, there would not appear to be any protection for confidential journalistic material, for example, if an examining officer looks at, say, a notebook containing names and contact details of confidential sources of part of assessing whether there is confidential material. Uh, I mean, in that situation, an examining officer cannot unremember what they have already seen. So the system that it's intended to operate um, does not, of course, mean that confidential material will not be seen by the examining officer, because as I understand it, but that's one of the questions I'm asking the government, that um, if the government is satisfied with the credentials of the person being examined, nevertheless the officer can still proceed to check material which that individual is claiming is of a confidential nature, that they do not have to apply straight away without looking at it to the commissioner to get the commissioner's um, approval for retention uh, and examination. And it would be helpful if the government could clarify that point. I think I know the answer already, but nevertheless it would be helpful if the government could clarify it. And also, could the government clarify that as far as they're concerned, what they are proposing meets the requirements of the Miranda judgment? I move. My, my Lords, I, I just want to briefly uh, agree in principle with the, the, um, the intention behind these uh, amendments, at least as far as confidential journalistic material is concerned. And, uh, uh, and material which is subject to legal privilege. Um, and, but I recognise the, the, the dilemma uh, in terms of whether you, whether, how do you determine whether it's confidential information if, unless you just take the person's word for it. And clearly, that would, if you just took a person's word for it, that the, 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 uh, the, the matter is confidential, then uh, anybody could get away with, with um, not handing documents over. Um, I don't think the, the uh, Amendment 69A uh, could work necessarily in practice in, in real time, uh, but there is a real problem here that needs uh, an explanation and some reassurance. My Lords, I hope I can um, assure Noble Lords uh, in the explanation I'm about to outline, but I thank Noble Lords who've, um, who've raised their concerns about the use of Schedule 3 Ports Powers to compel a journalist to reveal their material, including confidential material. Um, in drafting the bill, we've been very much alive to such concerns. I've been at pains to ensure that adequate safeguards, which I think is what Noble Lords are talking about, uh, are in place to protect confidential material, including confidential journalistic material. As the Noble Lord, uh, Lord Rosser pointed out, the new retention powers in respect of confidential information require the authorisation of the IPC who has to be satisfied that certain conditions are met before granting the authorisation. In earlier debates on the powers under uh, Schedule 3, I explained that a number of foreign powers and hostile actors are becoming even more bold and inventive in their methods. For example, and I've outlined this earlier, intelligence officers and their agency, agents actively use the cover of certain professions including journalism, uh, law and others, to ensure that our police officers are equipped to detect, disrupt and deter such activity, it is critical that they are able to retain, copy and examine documents or other articles which may contain confid confidential journalistic or legally privileged material. And that is why Schedule 3 introduces new powers and mechanisms to allow, allow for such action to be taken where the article, which may include confidential material, could be used in con connection with a hostile act or to prevent death or significant injury. I recognise that the protection of journalistic material held by any individual examined 
under Port's powers is a sensitive matter and one where we cl clearly need to get the safeguards in the bill right. But I want to be clear that the power in, powers in Schedule 3 are not intended to in any way uh, impede uh, or uh, disrupt the vital work of journalists in any way. Journalistic freedoms of speech and expression are the absolute cornerstone of our democracy, which should be protected in the exercise of any police powers. The provisions in this bill, however, are aimed at those who seek to abuse our legal frameworks to put our national security at risk and who are often trained to do so. Amendment 68 would allow a person to refuse a request for documents or information where the information or documents in question consist of journalistic material as defined by PACE and the IP Act or subject to legal privilege. In practice, this would prohibit the examining officer from verifying that the material in question is indeed confidential and would require the officer to take the examinee at their word. Amendment 69A is similar, and while it doesn't quite go as far as allowing a person to refuse to re provide requested documents or information, it would prohibit an examining officer from verifying that material is confidential. Instead, it would be for the IPC to determine that question. My Lords, restricting the powers in this way would be problematic, particularly where the examinee is a trained, hostile actor. Amendment 68 would provide a ground for a person to refuse to hand over documents or information simply by claiming that the material is journalistic or legally privileged. Furthermore, it would mean that the examining officer could not seek to examine such material where there is a need by retaining material and applying for authorisation from the IPC. Amendment 69A is also concerning as it would impose a restriction on the examining officer such that they were unable to establish their own reasonable belief that the article does in fact consist of confidential material. The police have a duty to protect our citizens and prevent crime. They cannot be expected to take at face value the word of someone they are examining who, in some cases, will be motivated to lie. My Lords, it's important to note that there are additional safeguards to govern the retention of property under Schedule 3 that consists of or includes confidential material. The IPC will only authorise the retention and use of the material if satisfied that arrangements are in place that are sufficient for ensuring that the material is retained securely and that the material will only uh, uh, will be used only so far as necessary and proportionate for a relevant purpose. That is, in the interests of national security or the economic well-being of the United Kingdom, or for the purposes of preventing or detecting serious crime, or for the purposes of preventing death or significant injury. The Government is of the view that it is reasonable to expect that an examining officer will need to review material to conclude one way or another that specific items are or include confidential journalistic or legally priv privileged material. That being said, the draft Schedule 3 Code of Practice is clear that, if, and, and I quote, if during the process of examining an article it becomes apparent to the examining officer that there are reasonable grounds for believing that the article consists of or includes items that are confidential material, the examining officer must cease examining and not copy these items unless he or she believes there are grounds to retain it. Close quotes. Under paragraph 11 2D or E. My Lords, these provisions in paragraph 11 of Schedule 3 contain the retention powers involving oversight by the IPC and the safeguards that I described earlier. I do acknowledge that handling of confidential material requires vigilance and discretion to safeguard it against unnecessary examination or retention, which is why the mechanisms under paragraph 12, 13 and 15 of Schedule 3 in relation to these retention powers require prior author authorisation of the IPC to be sought, save in exceptional circumstances before an examining officer is able to examine such material. We are therefore confident that the safeguards provided for uh, in Schedule 3 and the associated draft code of practice 
are sufficient to protect the work and privacy of legitimate journalists and lawyers and are also consistent with the Court of Appeal's judgment in Schedule 7 case of Miranda that, and I quote, independent and impartial oversight was the natural and obvious adequate safeguard in examination cases invo involving journalistic material. My Lord's Amendment 69 would extend this bar to information and documents uh, where the material falls under the definition of journalistic material as defined by PACE and the IP Act. Such a position would go much further than safeguarding the examinee against self-incrimination. By extending the statutory bar to cover information or documents that are, are considered to be journalistic material, Amendment 69 could prevent evidence of a hostile act from being used in criminal proceedings where it has been acquired through the le legitimate examination of confidential material on the authorisation of the IPC. And this would significantly undermine the ability of the police and the CPS to prosecute hostile actors who have used journalistic cover to disguise their criminal activities and been uncovered through the Schedule 3 examination powers. Um, just to answer uh, the noble lord, Lord Rosser, an officer can proceed to verify material uh, is com confidential, subject to IPC authorisation, look at confidential material, even if satisfied of the credentials of the journalist, who might nevertheless be a hostile state actor. My lords, um, Turning to uh, Amendment 71, this concerns the definition of confidential um, material at paragraph 1210 of Schedule 3 and the associated protections. Um, for purposes of Schedule 3, confidential material adopts the definition of the IP, uh, the IP Act. This definition would cover, for example, journalistic material in a communication which the sender intends, to re intends the recipient to hold in confidence. And as I explained earlier, this material would fall under the definition of confidential material. It can't be used or retained by an examining officer unless, unless authorised by the IPC. My Lords, I hope with those explanations that Noble Lords might feel, I'm sorry for the lengthy explanation, but I hope upon those ex explanations Noble Lords will feel happy to withdraw their amendments. Mm. Lords, um, I have listened very carefully and will reread um, the Noble Lady and the Minister's um, arguments tomorrow, but I, I don't feel entirely comforted and I do hope the government feels that this has been a useful debate in terms of perhaps adjusting their position and I very much hope that will happen because I feel <clears throat> while we talk all the time about hostile actors and people who could lie, we're also relying so much on the um, individual person who is stopping them and on their discretion and on their judgment and when there is <clears throat> so much leeway for these people to use, then I feel that, that there are opportunities for um, wrong decisions, which could impact quite heavily on, on some people. Um, but thank you, and I beg leave to withdraw. Is it your Lordship's pleasure that this amendment be withdrawn? Amendment is by leave withdrawn. Amendment 69, not moved. Amendment 70, uh, move formally. Move formally. <coughs> the question is that Amendment 70 uh, be agreed to. 69A. 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 I'm, sorry, I'm so sorry. 69A, not moved. Not moved. Yeah, but the question is that uh, Amendment 70 uh, be agreed to. As many as are of that opinion will say content. 69A. Just oh, done it. <laughs> as many as are of that opinion will say content. The contrary, not content. The contents have it. Uh, amendment 71. Not moved. Not moved. Uh, Baroness Williams, 72 to 80 being moved formally on block? On block. The question is that Amendment 72 to 80 inclusive uh, be agreed to on block. As many as are of that opinion will say content. The contrary, not content. Uh, the contents have it. 81, not moved. Amendment 82 moved formally? formally. The question is that Amendment 82 be agreed to. As many as are of that opinion will say content. The contrary, not content, but the contents have it. 83, not moved. 84, not moved. 85, not moved. 86, not moved. 87, not moved. 
88, not moved. The question is that Schedule 3, as amended, uh, be the third schedule to the bill. As many as are of that opinion will say content. Okay. Contrary, not content. The contents have it. The question is that uh, Clause 22 stand part of, of the bill. As many as are of that opinion will say content. Okay. Contrary, not content. The contents have it. The question is that Schedule 4 be the fourth schedule to the bill, as many as are of that opinion will say content. Okay. Entry not content. The contents have it. The question is that clauses 23 and 24 stand part of the bill, as many as are of that opinion will say content. Okay. Contrary not content. The contents have it. Clause 25. My Lords, I don't wish to detain the committee for long on this clause, but I'd like to put a couple of points on the record about the devolution implications <coughs> of this bill. My Lords, counter-terrorism and national security are reserved matters in Scotland and Wales and accepted matters in Northern Ireland. Consequently, in the view of the UK Government, none of the provisions in the bill relate to matters within the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament, National Assembly for Wales or Northern Ireland Assembly. Nonetheless, we recognise that there will be an impact on devolved criminal justice agencies in Scotland and Northern Ireland and on local authorities in Scotland and Wales. Consequently, we have consulted the devolved administrations extensively throughout the preparation of the Bill and subsequently during its parliamentary passage. I am very grateful for the collaborative approach adopted by the Scottish Government and Northern Ireland Department of Justice towards this Bill so that we can ensure that it is fit for purpose in Scotland and Northern Ireland, recognising that those parts of the UK have a criminal justice system distinct from that in England and Wales. It is the case that there are two provisions in the Bill which impact on the executive competence of the Scottish Ministers, namely those relating to the power to charge for an anti-terrorism traffic regulation order in Clause 15 and the amendment to the Legal Aid Scotland Act 1986 in Schedule 4. I am therefore also grateful to the Scottish Government for taking forward a legislative consent motion in relation to these provisions. The motion is due to be debated in the Scottish Parliament later this month. Uh, my Lords, uh, with, with that, uh, I, I beg to move that Clause 25 stand part of the Bill. The question is that Clause 25 stand part of the Bill. As many as are of that opinion will say content. Okay. Contrary, not content. The contents have it. Clause 26, Amendment 89, Baroness Howard, if you could. Not moved? My Lords, um, I rise to move Amendment 89 in my name. And in doing so, I want to thank Noble Baroness the Minister for the letter that she sent to Noble Lords before <coughs> committee stage began, responding to a number of different concerns, including the, the point I made at second reading. I am grateful for that response and will use it as my starting point in moving these amendments today. By way of introduction, it would probably help if I recapsulated my central concern, which I expressed at second reading, and uh, is the reason why I'm moving these amendments today. My Lords, it's absolutely right that the Government should do everything in its power to tackle the great evil that is terrorism. The events of last year must cause them to apply themselves to the development of really effective policy and legislation to deal with the threat terrorism poses with even greater determination than before. Part of our response to terrorism is to say that it has no place here and to defend the British commitment to liberty and all of the attendant constitutional safeguards that uphold it. In this context, it seems to me that when we cross from terrorism to extremism, which is not related to terrorism, we enter very difficult territory. Whilst I have no problem with the state intervening when someone's values cause them to either commit a terrorist act or to glorify 
a terrorist act or to encourage others to engage in a terrorist act, I have the greatest difficulty with the idea of censoring extremism without a connection to terrorism. My Lord, when we start to engage extremism with no connection to terrorism, it seems to me that we enter entirely different territory. It is all so very subjective. One person's extreme views could be another person's common sense, just as their common sense could seem extreme to another person. Part of the challenge of living in a free society is accommodating differences of opinion, including those that we may find, or, or want of, for want of a better phrase, nutty and extreme. I feel uncomfortable about the idea that we should start policing these thoughts. <coughs> Having reminded noble lords of this backdrop, I now turn to detailed consideration of my amendment and the noble Bar Baroness and Minister's letter. As things stand, Clause 19 amends Section 36 of the Counterterrorism Act 2015 which requires local government to seek to identify those at risk of being drawn into terrorism. Clause 19 broadens the scope of Section 36, and the point that I made at second reading was that Clause 19 should not be implemented until such a time as the accompanying guidance is updated to prevent policing people's views, which the state describes as extreme, but which do not uh, espouse and celebrate acts of violence. There's no basis for that reach beyond terrorism in the primary legislation. In no response, the Noble Baroness, the Minister, has suggested that the Channel guidance is very clear that the point at which an intervention is made is the point at which the person concerned is indeed deemed at risk of either espousing, celebrating or committing acts of violence. There are, however, two problems. First, while the Channel guidance is clear about the point of intervention, to bring someone in, it actually ranges rather more widely. This is reflected in the references to extremism in the channel guidance where there is no need for any reference to, to terrorism. Paragraph 51, for example, encourages the consideration of, and I quote, indicators that an individual is engaged with an extremist group, cause or ideology, in quote. He goes on to say that these indicators include things like spending increasing time in the company of other suspected extremists, day-to-day -day behavior, becoming increasingly cent uh, centered around an extremist ideology, group or cause. My Lord, it seems to me that as currently defined, the channel guidance mandates two forms of intervention. An intervention uh, when there is a perceived risk that someone is in danger of being drawn into terrorism, with which I have no difficulty, and a prior intervention that the purpose of monitoring, because the state does not like the views espoused, even though they have nothing to do with espousing, celebrating or committing acts of terrorism. Of course I have no difficulty with the idea of monitoring to identify when someone is at risk of being drawn into terrorism, but that must be because they are coming under the influence of those who are in some sense connected to terrorism and not simply because they come into contact with those whose views the state deems extreme. My Lords, that is a key distinction but it is one that I am not convinced the channel guidance currently respects. In expressing this concern, I would highlight once again the judgment in the case of Salman Butt. In her letter, the noble Baroness Minister suggested that Mr Justice Oosley's judgment in that case merely underlines and vindicates the current approach of the government in being clear that the point of intervention is when there is a risk that the person will be drawn into violence. 
With respect, however, Mr. Justice Usley was underlining this distinction in response to a concern that while on some occasions it is being respected by guidance, on other occasions it is not. Now, my Lords, of course I fully understand that Mr. Justice Usley's judgment refers specifically to the prevent guidance, but I think the same principle should be applied with respect to the channel guidance. This takes me to the second difficulty with the government's response. In her letter, the noble baroness minister suggested that the only relevant guidance at this point is the channel guidance, inferring that other forms of guidance, such as the prevent guidance and the counter-extremist strategy, simply are not relevant. I do not find that argument in any way convincing. Quite apart from anything else, paragraphs 6 and 7 of section 1 of the channel guidance relate, relate it to prevent and the prevent guidance. In this context, it seems entirely possible that those discharging their duties under section 36 of the 2015 Act will feel it entirely appropriate to allow their conduct, conduct, conduct to be Im impacted by the broad approaches set out in that document. Moreover, it seems entirely reasonable to me that someone discharging their duties under Section 36 and wanting a better handle on extremism should turn to the counter-extremism strategy or counter-terrorism strategy for additional guidance. These documents, however, completely fail to respect the crucial distinction that Mr. Justice Usley sets out in his judgment. For example, uh, paragraph 74 of the latest version of the Conte Terrorism Strategy states, and I quote, we protect the values of our society, the rule of law, individual liberty, democracy, mutual respect, tolerance and understanding of different faiths and beliefs by tackling extremism in all its forms. Paragraph 124, meanwhile, references the channel guidance and says, channel is run in every local authority in England and Wales and addresses all types of extremism. The counter-extremism strategy, meanwhile, states in paragraph 4, and I quote, we are clear that this strategy will take all forms of extremism, violent and non-violent. This is just a few of the examples. This means that the guidance that feeds into thinking about the application of the duty to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism or assessing the extent to which identified individuals are vulnerable to being drawn into terrorism is broadened to cover a very broad concept of extremism where uh, th th there is not always a connection to terrorism. My Lords, I believe that this is simply not acceptable and that the government needs to rein in its focus away from extremism in all its forms to focus very specifically on those who espouse, celebrate or commit acts of violence or who are in danger of doing so. In making that point and in moving this amendment that would require the channel guidance to prevent duty guidance for counter-terrorism and counter-extremism strategies to be updated so they do not transgress beyond the narrow focus on a necessary connection to violence, to extremism in all its forms. I will close by quoting from the Salman Butt judgment in which Mr. Justice Usley stated very clearly that the, the prevent duty does not refer to all forms of extremism as defined in the prevent duty guidance of 2015 and the counter extremism strategy of 2015. Mr. Justice Oosley rightly said that extremism is, I quote, the active opposition to fundamental British values, which must in some respect risk drawing others into terrorism before the guidance applies to it. 
If there is some non-violent extremism, however intrinsically undesirable, which does not create a risk that others will be drawn into terrorism, the guidance does not apply to it. Thus, the prevent duty does not apply to all forms of extremism and specifically not to non-violent extremism if there is no risk of people being drawn into terrorism. The prevent duty guidance should be updated so that uh, the guidance consistently reflects this position. The other relevant guidance documents that could also have bearing on the discharging of the responsibilities defined by Section 36 of the 2015 Act, which Clause 19 amends, should be similarly updated. Moreover, these docu documents should also be updated to reflect the distinction that Mr Justice Usley has made in their application generally beyond section 36. Uh, my Lord, I beg to move. Amendment proposed at page 25, line 30, at the beginning insert the words, subject to subsection 2A. I'd like to congratulate uh, the Noble Baroness, Lady Howe, uh, for bringing forward these amendments, 89 and 91, and I am very content to support them. Like the Noble Baroness Lady Howe, I also scrutinised the Noble Baroness, the Minister's letter, and I'd like to come back to it. The letter makes two key claims with respect to the channel guidance. First, it states, and I quote, the channel duty guidance is clear that preventing terrorism will mean challenging extremist and non-violent ideas that are also part of terrorist ideology. In this context, she argues that the only point of intervention will be where ext extremist ideas are used, and I quote, to legi legitimise terrorism and are shared by terrorist groups. In truth, however, as the noble Baroness Lady Howe has pointed out, the guidance contains some references to extremism that are not rooted in a necessary connection to terrorism, and it thereby effectively mandates two interventions. One, quite properly, where there is concern that the individual in question is being drawn into terrorism. The other, however, is effectively a monitoring intervention to monitor people whose views the state considers extreme, but in relation to which there is no need for any immediate connection to terrorism. I assume that the thought is that because they have extreme views, there is a chance they could at some point show signs of interest in terrorism but in the absence of anything other than a vague definition of extremism, this opens the door for the state to start monitoring any views its officers decide are extreme. My Lord, I find this second intervention Orwellian and illiberal. The parent legislation in Section 36 of the 2015 Act provides a very clear and narrow remit that is confined to terrorism. It is completely inappropriate to issue guidance that strays into undefined views that the state or its representatives happen to find extreme unless they are connected to espousing or celebrating terrorism. This problem is clearly underlined by the fact that paragraph 124 of the new counter-terrorism strategy published in June comments on the Channel programme and states, quote, Channel is run in every local authority in England and Wales, and addresses all types of extremism. Well, my lords, I think that tells us all we need to know. Extremism in all its form, and thus there is no necessary connection of any sort to terrorism. In addition, my lords, I have to say that I find the suggestion from the noble Baroness, the Minister, that to channel guidance is the only guidance that will inform the approach of local government officials in discharging their responsibilities under Section 36 somewhat disingenuous. Of course, I completely accept <coughs> that the Channel Guidance is the guidance uh, that has been spe specially developed to help local government discharge its responsibilities with respect to Section 36. It certainly is the guidance to which local authorities will refer first when considering their Section 36 responsibilities, but that absolutely does not mean 
that the other guidance documents to which the noble Baroness Lady Howe referred won't be consulted. The fact that the channel process is part of the prevent strategy is actually spelt out for us by the channel guidance. Paragraph 7 of Section 1 states, and I quote, Channel forms a key part of the prevent strategy. In this context, it would not be at all surprising if the prevent duty guidance was consulted in addition to the channel guidance to provide a broader context as channel is, by the guidance own admission, part of the prevent strategy. On the same basis, my lords, it would not be at all surprising if a local authority in want of a better understanding of extremism, also turn to the counter-extremism strategy, or if a local authority, in want of a better understanding of terrorism, also turn to the counter-terrorism strategy. This, my lords, is where Justice Owsley's judgment becomes so very important. In the noble Baroness, the Minister's letter, she said, and I quote again, the High Court in the case of Salmon Butt versus the Secretary of State for the Home Department, which Baroness Howe has already mentioned, was clear that the government was fully within its powers to include this form of non-violent extremism within the scope of the prevent duty guidance. Now, my lords, I completely accept that it is possible to find a good number of statements in the prevent duty guidance that are indeed consistent with this statement. Take paragraph 38, for example, that states, we expect local authorities to use the existing counter-terrorism local profiles produced for every region by the police to assess the risk of individuals being drawn into terrorism. This includes not just violent extremism, but also non-violent extremism, which can create an atmosphere conducive to terrorism and can popularise views which terrorists exploit. However, it is also possible to find numerous references to extremism in the prevent duty guidance where no such distinction applies. For example, in paragraph 106, prisons should perform initial risk assessments on reception, including cell sharing risk assessments and initial reception and induction interviews to establish concerns in relation to any form of extremism, be that faith-based, animal rights, environmental, far-right, far-left extremism, or any new emerging trends. Then consider paragraph 109. Appropriate information and intelligence sharing, sharing should take place, for example, with law enforcement partners to understand whether extremism is an issue and to identify and manage any behaviours of concern. Again, there is plainly no necessary link to terrorism here. Then let's consider paragraph 131. In addition, PCTLs should lead the development of, for example, faith awareness or extremism risk screening, training of local training, and staff development to supplement the prevent awareness training. This should focus on emerging issues and any new and interventions that become available. My Lords, I could go on, but in some ways the most damning statement from the guidance is the glossary definition of extremism, which provides the baseline account for the term in the guidance. The glossary in the 2015 guidance, which can be located on page 21, states, extremism is defined in the 2011 Prevent Strategy as vocal or active opposition to fundamental British values, including democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty and mutual respect and tolerance of different faiths and beliefs. We also include in our definition of extremism calls for the death of members of our armed forces, whether in this country or overseas. My Lords, crucially, this definition does not require any connection with terrorism. The calling for the death of servicemen is not necessary to meet the definition, which also does not require any other link to terrorism. In this glossary, definition of extremism that is being used to broaden the scope of the channel and prevent duties, the very moment these duties divert from their primary aim of addressing the risk of people being drawn into terrorism to addressing the risk of people being drawn into terrorism and extremism, where the two are contrasted, they clearly are not the same, we are at risk of becoming 
an Orwellian state. In this context, it is particularly concerning that, as reported by the Joint Committee on Human Rights, Dr. Charlotte Heath Kelly at the University of Warwick has warned about her concerns with local authority involvement in Prevent. As she said, we have found that this leads health to healthcare professionals and local authority processes to inquire into incidents of dissent and illiberal political beliefs, rather than vulnerability to abuse in persons with formal care needs, the legal definition of safeguard that is. For example, during our study of local authority-owned prevent work, we found cases where children had been referred to safeguarding terms for watching Arabic television and where adults were referred for planning pilgrimage trips. While these incidents did not reach channel, it is crucial that the Select Committee investigate the low-level and misguided monitoring of religiosity and political beliefs. People have a right to their beliefs without them being interpreted and medicalised as vulnerabilities. I very much hope that when the Noble Baroness, the Minister, responds to this debate, that she will acknowledge that there are real concerns here, and I very much hope that she might be willing to meet concerned members to discuss the matter between committee and report stages about the way the relevant guidance documents handle extremism. I should say, finally, that there are members of the other place who would also like to attend such a meeting with the Minister. They had wanted to raise this matter through a report stage amendment, but were somewhat taken aback by the fact that the day the Government announced the date for a report stage in another place was the very same day as the deadline for submitting amendments. This meant that the only amendments tabled at report stage in another place were from the front benches who knew in advance the date for report and thus the deadline for tabling amendments to explore these issues. There was not a single backbench amendment. Well, my Lords, can I thank uh, both the Noble Lord, Lord Morrow, and the Noble Lady, Lady Howe, um, for explaining uh, the amendments at length. And might I say right at the outset that I'm very happy to meet with um, both the Noble Lady and the Noble Lord um, in, in due course. Um, both at second reading and again today, the Noble Lady mentioned a number of guidance documents and strategies which she suggested would inform decisions made by local authorities about the referral of individuals to a channel panel. Among them, the Noble Lady referred to the Prevent Duty guidance. However, this guidance is not the relevant document which would give local authorities uh, through this process. Sorry, which would guide local authorities through this process. The Prevent Duty guidance concerns a separate duty, which is the wider Prevent Duty, contained in Section 26 of the Counter-Terrorism and Security Act of 2015. The proposal in Clause 19 instead talks to the duty of local authorities to maintain a panel to assess and provide support to people who are vulnerable to being drawn into terrorism, commonly known as the Channel Panel. The statutory basis for these channel panels is to be found in sections 36 to 41 of the 2015 Act. This is accompanied by its own statutory guidance issued under the power contained in section 36.7 known as channel duty guidance. The channel duty guidance is quite clear that preventing terrorism will mean challenging extremist and non-violent ideas that are also part of a terrorist ideology as the Noble Lord uh, and Ladies uh, pointed out. The guidance also states that the way in which vulnerability to being drawn into terrorism is to be assessed is through a vulnerability assessment framework containing 22 factors which can contribute to such vulnerability. The guidance goes on to say that association with organisations that are not proscribed and which ex espouse extremist ideology as defined in the PREVENT strategy is not on its own reasonable enough to justify a referral to a channel process. 
Given this, I am not persuaded uh, that the provisions in Clause 19 of the Bill, which, as I say, relate to channel panels and not the wider prevent duty, call for a wholesale revision of the channel guidance, and certainly not in respect of the issues raised by the noble lady. But we do keep the channel guidance under review, and from time to time, of course, it will need updating. Um, but it would be quite wrong to make the revision of this guidance of a separate prevent guidance a precondition of the commencement of the much needed provisions in the bill. But as I said earlier, I'm very happy to meet with the two noble lords and in the meantime, I would ask that uh, the noble lady withdraws her amendment. My lords, um, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the noble baroness minister for uh, that reply. Um, quite obviously, it's not one that I would have hoped for, uh, but nevertheless, it is something which uh, I will have to think about in quite a lot of detail before coming to a conclusion about uh, what should be happening at report stage. I also would like to thank the Noble, uh, uh, the noble Lord Lord. Uh, uh, Mario on uh, uh, about uh, for, for his contribution and uh, for backing up this what I can still consider to be a very important range of of, of, um, uh, of, of, of thoughts. Um, if I may, then uh, I think the answer is as there is a need for perhaps a little bit of of talk before we come to any full conclusions about this, um, that perhaps a look at diaries uh, before report stage would be a good thing and to fix a time convenient for all concerned. That's is it your Lordship's pleasure that this amendment be withdrawn? Amendment is by leave withdrawn. Amendment 90, Lord Rosser, not moved. Amendment 91, Marinus Howe, not moved. The question is that Clause 26 stand part of the Bill. As many as are of that opinion will say content. Yes. Contrary not, content, the contents have it. The question is that 20, Clause 27 stand part of the Bill. As many as are of that opinion will say content. Yes. Contrary not, content, the contents have it. The question is that this be the title of the Bill. As many as are of that opinion will say content. Yes. Contrary not, content, the contents have it. That concludes the, the committee's proceedings on the bill. The House will now resume. My Lords, the Committee of the Whole House, to which the Counter-Terrorism and Border Security Bill was committed, has gone through the same and has directed me to report it to your Lordships with amendment. No.